Hannah Colin Miles Briggs. Thank you. Our Scottish NHS faces many challenges. I believe it's the job of all of us in this Parliament to work to help create a sustainable and financially secure NHS for Scotland. Recent weeks have demonstrated just the level of financial mismanagement within our NHS which this government has presided over. Perhaps the most obvious example of this has been the scandal in NHS Tayside, which brought this to the public's attention in the most shocking of ways, when it was revealed that NHS Tayside took more than £2 million from its charitable endowment fund. Donations made up from the public or bequests in wills, simply to help cover the day-to-day -day running costs of that health board. The current financial situation in NHS Tayside is one which Audit Scotland over a number of years has highlighted as being high risk. According to Audit Scotland, NHS Tayside now must make over £205 million of savings over the next five years and is overspent in areas such as workforce costs, prescribing and clinical supplies. The situation in Tayside is shocking, but they are far from on their own. Just last week, NHS Lothian, my own health board, revealed to the Parliament's Health and Sport Committee that it too will require £31 million just to stand still at 2017 levels. NHS boards are queuing up at the Cabinet Secretary's door to beg for financial brokerage just to be able to keep delivering the health and social care services people across Scotland rely on. Presiding officer, it's worth reflecting that when this SNP government entered office in 2007, Audit Scotland noted that the Scottish NHS had a budget surplus of £50 million. Today, it is now predicted that our Scottish NHS could be overspent by over £400 million and struggling to find the cuts it needs to bridge the current gaps. All this despite receiving additional Barnet consequential funding of over £2.45 billion from the UK Government. Presiding officer, for every MSP in this Parliament, it must often seem like every warning light is on our NHS Scotland's dashboard. NHS Scotland has failed to meet 7 out of 10 key waiting time targets. More than a quarter of children are waiting too long for mental health services, some up to a year. More than one in eight cancer patients are waiting more than 62 days for urgent treatment. One in four GP practices in Scotland has a vacancy. A number of GP practices have been taken over by health boards due to staff shortages. Nearly one in 10 GP surgeries in Scotland is turning away new patients. There's over 400 vacant consultant posts and over two and a half thousand, two and a half thousand vacant nursing and midwifery posts. Yes. Julian Martin. The staffing at NHS, do you expect Brexit to have? Oh. Oh. Miles Briggs. Yeah. 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 It's a, no, it's a, it's, a, it's, a very, it's a very interesting point because 11 years into your government, Brexit is the excuse, but you've been cutting the training places. The First Minister cut the places. And that is where any vacancies in our Scottish NHS are because of this SNP government, and no one should forget that. Yeah, yeah. And like I said, also care homes across Scotland providing that care are closing at a rate of one a month. And just yesterday, yesterday we saw the publication of figures showing delayed discharge of patients has increased by 11% from February. Delayed discharge is a has a huge impact on people's lives when they're stuck in hospital and not able to get home or the appropriate care package put in place. The Cabinet Secretary, I'd like to make some progress, but I'll come back to you later on. The Cabinet Secretary will be acutely aware of these cases. I've raised with her on a number of cases of my own constituents here in Lothian who are stuck in hospital, sometimes for hundreds of days, unable to get a care package in place that they need. The increasing levels of delayed discharge is a significant indicator of a crisis in our health and social care services and one which is increasing in many communities. Presiding Officer, this represents... John Scott. Thank you. Um, would the member agree with me that it's absolutely appalling that there have been 33,000 bed days lost in NHS Ayrshire and Ireland in the last year? And can he tell me the overall number for the health service in Scotland of the Miles. number of days lost through delayed discharge? Miles Briggs. I thank the member for... They don't like to hear the truth for some reason in, in this parliament. And this is exactly what we are saying, presiding officer. These stories represent a shocking indictment of this SNP's government's record in charge of our health and social care services. But this is, no, I want to make some progress. This is not just about numbers on a spreadsheet. It's people's lives. It's our fellow Scots, our loved ones' lives. And this cabinet secretary and SNP government must get a grip of this situation. 
So today that is why the Scottish Conservatives have called for specific action and for a real strengthening of this Parliament's oversight and scrutiny of our NHS finances. That's why we called in our motion for the Cabinet Secretary to publish the full details of the current financial position of every NHS board and integrated joint board. Information I believe we should all have. And for the Scottish Government to commit to monthly updates being provided to this Parliament. And I welcome the email the Cabinet sent to me just at half past 12 today to accept these very points and to outline how she will take forward enhanced reporting of our NHS finances, which will begin in June. And I have other asks which I'll be making beyond that. But perhaps the most concerning issue, which I think we should be also really highlighting today, is that actually when we look at what is happening in our NHS, the financial crisis being faced by the 31 integrated joint boards is still yet to be revealed. All we Thank, Graham thank, Day, I think Graham Day. thank you. I thank my, uh, Miles Briggs for taking that intervention. Presenting officer, uh, amongst other things, the Conservative motion talks about IGB finances and being held to account. So I wonder if Miles Briggs would join me in condemning the actions of Angus Council, who failed to pass on to the local IGB more than a million pounds of an additional 1.56 million provided by the Scottish Government to support health and social care activities. And would he agree with me that the ruling coalition in Angus, which includes Conservative councillors should be held to account for depriving the IJB and my constituents of much needed funding. Miles Briggs. And this is, this is exactly a point why we're debating this today. And I think the, the member needs to understand the problems being faced by the health and social care uh, sector in Scotland. We all agree, and this is one thing, we all agree that the integration of health and social care is the right direction of, of travel to ensure people receive the vital care they need at the right time and in the right place, focused on community-based and preventative care models. But the member and the cabinet secretary need to also be abundantly clear that the SNP, this SNP reform is not delivering and there's growing concerns, which the members obviously outlined, uh, from those who sit on the IJBs and take these decisions. And I have to say, these include many SNP councillors who have even contacted me across Scotland at the role, the remit and the effectiveness yeah. and decisions. That's how, that's how the much even your own councillors have given up on you and this government. The integrated joint boards... The integrated joint boards are now responsible for almost £8.73 billion of taxpayer spending in our health and social care services. Yet the financial accountability and reporting within IJBs is inconsistent and erratic at best. Increasingly, the budget pressures which IJBs face is directly influencing their decision making. No, I want to make some progress. Um, it's affecting their decision making. Decisions to cut mental health beds and services, for example. Now, Audit Scotland, again, has called on the Scottish Government to make fundamental decisions about how they provide these services. And I welcome the Government's acceptance that we need greater financial accountability of IJBs, but I also believe that we need to now take time to ensure that they are truly fit for purpose. This is a major reform this Parliament passed in the last session, which we need to make sure is fit for purpose for our communities in this session. Scottish Conservatives therefore also set out our own motion and in our motion that we want to see the Cabinet Secretary commit to a review of the integrated joint boards to fully understand their current financial position, yes, but also to look to how effective they have been and what future reforms of them may be needed. We cannot and we will not just stand on the sidelines and watch a crisis in our social care system build ever greater. Presiding Officer, part of this debate I did not want to make personal the future of our NHS and its financial sustainability, I believe, is too important for that. As I've said in recent weeks, and maybe the SNP members should start to listen, when Labour and the Liberal Democrats have called for the Cabinet Secretary to be sacked, I haven't gone down that road. The truth is, I don't think there's anything, anyone on the SNP benches who could actually set up and step up to the challenge. And we've had a look around. We've had a look around you. Fergus Ewing has pride... Fergus, Fergus Ewing, is he in today? Fergus Ewing's presided over the farm payments fiasco. We've seen our once world-class Scottish education system decline under Angela Constance and now John Swinney. And Police Scotland, where do we start on Michael Matheson and the problems and issues facing Police Scotland and the SNP's centralisation? So the question is really, who on, the S who, who on the SNP benches think they could do any better? Put, put your hand up if you do. <laughs> Anybody? No. That tells you all, that tells you all you need. Oh, I, I, uh, I didn't, I didn't really have you in mind. Mr Briggs, I'm afraid we, we have a point of order from Christina McKelvey.
Uh, thank you very much, presiding officer. I wonder, I'm interested to hear what the Conservatives have got to say in this debate, but personal attack, personal slight on members of this chamber and bringing down the, the reputation of this chamber should not be what's coming from the Tories today. And I'd quite like Mr Briggs to actually speak to his motion, not to um, um, impudiate the reputations of people in this chamber. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Ms McKelvey. I'm very alert to any personal attacks that take place. However, there's also some room for robust exchanges, and I think in this case it was within. within. But I would encourage all members to keep the debate to uh, the, the, the substance and not to the personalities. Mr Briggs. Thank you. And let me be absolutely clear to the Cabinet Secretary, the mismanagement and financial chaos facing our NHS cannot continue. It's impacting on our health service and NHS staff morale. And that's exactly why the Scottish Conservatives are putting the SNP government on notice over their handling of the financial crisis facing Scotland's health boards. And the need for action, action to prevent the next major financial crisis in the integrated joint boards happening. These two critical issues facing our Scottish NHS have developed on the SNP's watch over the last 11 years. And now we need a government that will get a grip of this dire situation that they have created. That's why I believe we as a parliament need to seek this urgent action. We must return our NHS to a secure and sustainable financial footing. And I move the motion in my name. Thank you, Thank you very much. And I call on the Cabinet Secretary, Sean Robinson. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. I move the amendment uh, in my name. Let me start by saying that I am immensely proud of our NHS. Staff do a fantastic job day in and day out. They often go the extra mile as witnessed during the severe winter weather with heroic efforts to get to work to keep patients safe. And with our world leading patient safety programme, we have one of the safest systems in the world with international interest in how that has been achieved. The vast majority of patients get a fantastic and timely service and the fact that patient satisfaction levels are higher than ever would suggest that this is the case with 90% of Scottish inpatients saying hospital care and treatment was good or excellent. So I have no problem being held accountable for our NHS. That is my job. Is it a perfect system? No, it's not. Sometimes in a system with the size and scale of the NHS, things go wrong. And I'm sure we'll hear examples of this today. What's important in each of those cases is that there is an openness to reflect and learn from them, which the new duty of candour encourages. On that point about uh, patient safety, presiding officer, members may be aware of news emerging of a breast screening error affecting 450,000 women in England. Jeremy Hunt has just made a statement earlier to the House of Commons. Given the significant public interest, I wanted to take the opportunity to reassure members and the public that this issue does not affect the NHS in Scotland and patients should be reassured that there are no problems with our breast screening programme records or IT systems. As usual, all women should continue to be aware of changes to their breasts and if they have any concerns, they should see their GP. Scottish Government officials will be working with Public Health England to identify any women affected in England who have subsequently moved to Scotland. Presiding Officer, our NHS sometimes struggle to cope with rising demand, like every health system across these islands and beyond. Despite record high NHS staffing, up over 13,000, our performance on key targets is not where I would want it to be. While Scotland's core A&E services are the best performing in the UK for more than three years now, 10% better than they were three years ago, there are some sites which still struggle and need to improve. While we're now seeing a downward trend in delayed discharge with a reduction of 7% in total bed days lost compared to the previous year, there is still much work to be done, especially in areas like Lothian. Of course, that's why we're driving forward both investment and reform in a second. That's why we're driving forward both investment and reform of our NHS to meet the rising demand and challenges now and into the future. Yes. Miles Briggs. Thank the member for taking that intervention. Um, in 2014, the Cabinet Secretary stood where she is uh, today and said that she would achieve a zero delay discharge in our hospitals. When is that target actually going to be met? You're absolutely right, and I do want to eradicate delayed discharge, but it is a difficult thing to do. And actually, Miles Briggs alluded to some of the challenges earlier on. Our integrated joint boards work very hard, but there is huge variation in performance there. 
Glasgow, for example, has almost eradicated delay, whereas areas like Edinburgh have not. And there is a new chief officer in place who I think will do a fantastic job in that domain. So, you know, I am not um, underestimating the scale of the problem here. And good ideas are always welcome, presiding officer, wherever they come from across uh, the chamber. On the subject of investment in the NHS and care services, let me turn now to address the financial issues in the motion. And let me say, I'm more than happy to do so. Ensuring that there are sufficient resources in the NHS is something I do every day. The Scottish Government's budget for 2018-19, supported by the Greens, delivered additional investment in health of over £400 million and takes the resource budget to £13.1 billion. This government, in a minute, this government remains on track to deliver its commitment to increase health resource spending by £2 billion by the end of this parliament. It is clear that this level of investment has only been made possible without um, impacting on other public services through the progressive tax policies which we have implemented. Health spending is £360 million more than inflation since 2016-17. Uh, had we not taken the budget decisions we had, then the resources available to our health and care services would have been considerably less. I'll give away on that point. Can I thank Mike the Robin. Cabinet Secretary for, for taking the intervention? You should be aware that I've pointed out before that over the last 10 years, NHS Grampian has been shortchanged by £165 million from her own target figures. Will, although that is being reduced now, the, the difference is being reduced now, will NHS Grampian ever get that money back? Cabinet Secretary. Well, as I've said to the member on a number of occasions, NHS Grampian is one of the biggest gainers from the NRAC formula and again does so this year. But let me turn to the Tory motion. If the Tories are suggesting that the health and care budget is inadequate, which I think Miles Briggs was suggesting in his speech, then they do have a responsibility to set out what level of funding they would propose and how this would be funded, particularly in the light of their opposition to progressive use of taxation. Under the Tory tax plans, there would have been £500 million less available for public finances, including the NHS. So Miles Briggs does have a responsibility and perhaps in the closing speeches from the Tories, we'll hear about the level of resources that they think the NHS should have and where those resources will come from. Many of the areas Miles Briggs raises in his motion today are areas that I've been engaging with the Health and Sport Committee on for some time. In response to the financial issues and asks raised in the Tory motion, I have today written to the Health Committee providing information on the first round of consolidated financial reports for integration authorities, an update on NHS Board's financial performance and the development of a medium-term financial framework for health and social care. I've agreed to review progress of the integration authorities and I believe this is best done through the Ministerial Strategic Group. I'm happy to share with the Health and Sport Committee the outputs and any further actions that arise from this with the committee. I've also set out my proposal to provi provide monthly information on N NHS Board's financial performance for 2018-19. Board's first formal reporting period for the financial year will be available in June and we'll report monthly thereafter to the Health and Sport Committee. So I hope that Miles Briggs and others agree that what has been set out is a reasonable proposal to address the concerns set out in the motion and provide greater transparency and accountability to this parliament. In responding to the recommendation from the Auditor General, I've committed to publish a medium term financial framework, which will take account of key programme for government commitments along with an understanding of the financial environment and approach required to ensure financial sustainability. This framework will be published in the coming weeks and will set out clearly the environment in which we are operating. In particular, it will set out longer term funding needs. I'm confident that the publication of this framework will be an important part in giving greater clarity to NHS boards and integration authorities as they develop their plans for the coming years. And this supports the principle as asked for by the Greens. Of course. Miles Briggs. As I said in my um, speech, I welcome the fact that the government has accepted um, these reforms and accepted them within our motion. Would you be able to tell Parliament today what level of overspend does NHS Scotland actually stand at today? Does she have that figure? 
Cabinet Secretary. Well, we will get the first two months of the financial planning for 2018-19 at the end of June. And I'm sure Miles Briggs, as I do, wants accurate, robust information. So the health finance reporting cycle has the first two months. That's how it happens every year. The first two months of the financial year published in June. And that will be made available to the Health and Sport Committee and then monthly reporting thereafter, very briefly. That maybe also is published is past year's situations. So I think it's important this Parliament see the direction of travel as well. Can I'm very happy to provide that information, but the position, the 1718 position, has already been made available to the Health and Sport Committee. But you know, if there's any more information I can provide, I'm very happy to do that. I want um, to meet the, the needs of the Parliament in terms of the budget scrutiny process. The Auditor General has previously called uh, for greater financial certainty for NHS boards. But I'll say at this point that a UK multi-year funding settlement as has been proposed by the Prime Minister, no less, along with this government's commitment to pass on all health consequentials will go a long way to providing our health and social care partners with greater certainty of funding that they need. I also welcome the opportunity to discuss with members the steps we are taking at a local level in response to governance and accountability issues. I've given a detailed statement in Parliament setting out my response to the issues at NHS Tayside and the details on the investigations will be scrutinised by the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee in the coming months. It will be important that all parties take stock following these reviews and that we all learn lessons from the situation in Tayside and make improvements for the future. I also set out in my statement that we would be receiving, not just now, I set out in my statement that we would be receiving returns from all boards by the 30th of April. I can, however, confirm that all boards which hold endowment funds have now responded to a letter from the DG Health and Social Care about their approach to and use of endowment funds. Re these responses have been passed to Oscar to review, but I can confirm today that there was nothing in the responses that is a cause for concern and no boards are showing retrospective use of endowment funds in order to improve their financial position as happened in Tayside. These returns have now been passed to Oscar for external scrutiny and review. I'll ensure that any recommendations from Oscar in relation to the future governance arrangements of endowment funds are fully supported. In conclusion, uh, presiding officer, in my time as Scotland's health secretary, spending on health has seen the largest increase of any country in the UK and the largest increase per head on spending anywhere in the UK. I will always fight for the interests of our NHS. Reform of the NHS is equally as important as investment in it. I've set and trained a huge range of actions to make the improvements that we need to see both now and into the future, including the new primary care workforce plan pub published just on Monday to sit alongside the other two workforce plans. There's much in our NHS and care services to be proud of, but I'm not complacent. And that's why I've set out the range of actions already underway. I've listened to calls for greater transparency around finances and I've agreed to the actions today to deliver that. That's why this government will continue its approach of meeting the challenges we face, delivering sustained improvement and serving the people of Scotland both now and for the years and generations ahead. Thank you. I now call on Anas Sarwar to speak to and move Amendment 11984.1. Anas Sarwar. Presiding officer, I move the amendment in my name. Another week and more appalling figures on the performance of the Health Secretary. This is not a one-off. This is the latest in a series of failures by this Cabinet Secretary. Now, while the Tory motion and the Government amendment focus on the financial impact and important issue, both ignore the human consequences. The consequences for NHS staff who continue to go above and beyond and for NHS patients who are being let down by the failings of this government. Every time there is a failure, we get the same old warm words and tired excuses from this health secretary when year on year her performance is declining. Declining performance on workforce, more than 3,000 nursing vacancies, one in three GP practices reporting a vacancy with GP practices closing lists and some GP practices closing down. Hundreds of consultant vacancies and a doubling in the rate of early retirement on the Health Secretary's watch. Presiding officer, Shona Robeson is right to thank the staff, but her thanks is not enough. We cannot continue to overwork, under-resource and undervalue staff 
without there being human consequences. We heard last week from the BMA and the Royal College of Paediatrics, such is the pressure on staff, there are now real fears over patient safety. And don't forget, it was the Cabinet Secretary's best friend, Nicola Sturgeon, who as Health Secretary cut the number of nurse and midwife training places, and we are now living with those dangerous consequences. Our NHS, in the midst of a workforce crisis for which Shona Robinson must take responsibility. Failure on delayed discharge. In February 2015, Shona Robinson promised, and I quote, I want to, over the course of this year, eradicate delayed discharge, and I'm absolutely determined to do that. But since that promise, presiding officer, more than 1.6 million bed days have been lost to delayed discharge. 1.6 million, costing the NHS 380 million pounds. But worse than the financial cost has been the human cost. More than 1,000 patients have died in hospital while trapped in hospital as a delayed discharge. 1,000. Another failure of this Health Secretary. On cancer, a national priority. In the last year, more than 1,700 people suspected of having cancer had to wait longer than the expected treatment standard. And even after being referred for treatment by doctors, more than 1,200 people with cancer had to wait longer than the expected treatment standard. Shocking figures that expose the failure of this Health Secretary. And today, unbelievably, the Health Secretary sneaks out this report, which shows that rather than improving their performance, the government's plan is to scrap the standard waiting time for cancer. Shameful behaviour from a shameless Health Secretary. And on a &E, the report is right here, Cabinet Secretary. You wrote the foreword. So, so far, and no press release to go alongside it. It was snuck out today. And on a and &E, so far in 2018, more than 52,000 people waited longer than four hours. More than 7,000 waited longer than eight hours. And unbelievably, almost 2,000 waited for more than 12 hours. That is the same so far this year as the whole of 2017. Another failure of this Cabinet Secretary. On cancelled operations, to date in 2018, over 3,000 operations have been cancelled due to capacity or non-clinical reasons because hospitals could not cope. 3,000 operations. That's the consequence of the Health Secretary's workforce crisis. On the ambulance service, last week Richard Leonard shared the terrible story of Margaret Goodman. But we know that this isn't an isolated case. In 2017, more than 16,000 people waited more than an hour for an emergency ambulance. 16,000. 16,000 emergency patients failed by Shona Robinson. On budgets, health boards having to make over £1 billion of cuts over the next four years. In her own backyard, NHS Tayside, having to make £200 million worth of cuts over the next five years. And the result? The Health Secretary's own health board taking money from charitable donations to support an IT system because of budget cuts imposed on them by this Health Secretary. So many people failed. 3,000 people failed in operations. 16,000 ambulance patients. 52,000 on A&E. 1,200 12, 12, people, 1, people sorry, on cancer waiting times. 1,700 people suspected of cancer. 1 1.6 million bed days lost on delayed discharge. She owes not just one apology, she owes thousands of apologies to patients across the country. Yet no shame, no accountability and no responsibility from Shona Robeson. Because the uncomfortable truth, Cabinet Secretary, is that it isn't just opposition parties, NHS staff and patients that have lost confidence in you. Even SNP backbenchers are now briefing the media and calling on Shona Robeson to go. We have the Bring Back Alec Neal campaign, led by Alec Neal. And we even have the Gene Freeman telling the media 
about how brilliant Gene Freeman would be as the Health Secretary, but in fact it appears there are only two people in the chamber who don't think Shona Robeson should go, Nicola Sturgeon and Miles Briggs. Because while I understand why the Tories wouldn't want to talk about failing government ministers resigning, who would have thought it would be they who provided a fig leaf for the failings of Shona Robeson? I'm in my last 30 seconds, so I won't take the intervention. You President can officer, if you wish, there is some extra I'm time. Happy, I'm happy to take the intervention. Miles Briggs. I'd, I'd just like to know if the member could tell us how many times has he now called for the Cabinet Secretary to go? I think at last count it was 11. Is that an effective opposition? Yeah. Well, I, I, I think the interesting stat, Mr Briggs, and let's talk about the number of the Health Secretary's constituents who want her to go. A courier poll showing that 73% of people in Dundee want the Cabinet Secretary to go. Because, presiding officer, Scotland's NHS needs change. Change that starts right at the top of the organisation. Because the First Minister has misplaced loyalties. Her loyalty should be to Scotland's NHS, not to her friend. So do the right thing, First Minister. The right thing for NHS staff. The right thing for NHS patients. And for the sake of Scotland's NHS, sack this failing Health Secretary. Uh, thank you. I call uh, Mr. Arthur. I, Mr. Arthur, nobody can hear me calling the next speaker because she's so noisy. Can I call, please, now Alison Johnson? Ms. Johnson, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I regret that we're called to address the financial problems facing NHS boards. In October, Audit Scotland's annual report on the NHS warned of intensifying pressures on our, on our health service. It told us achieving financial balance is harder each year and current approaches to making savings are unsustainable. Since then, new issues have come to light, not least the inappropriate transfer of e-health funds and NHS Tayside. Then we must turn to the matter of charity endowment funds being misused and financial difficulties stretching way beyond Tayside. Many boards require brokerage and in my own region, NHS Lothian, as we've heard, there's an indication of a £31 million gap in funding. Now, the picture isn't uniform, but throughout Scotland, there are boards struggling with delayed discharges, those who continually fail to meet CAMS tar targets, um, and ambulance, and boards where ambulance response times are not adequate. And as the Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health have highlighted, paediatricians too are under huge pressure. They advise that we need an additional 110 paediatric consultants over the next five years to just make sure sick children get the care they need. All this raises the most serious questions about the oversight and governance of our health service and social care system. We cannot, however, place additional pressure on health boards and IGBs to restore financial balance by making unsustainable short-term cuts to spending and services. Labour's amendment today is right to emphasise that financial pressures can be added to by a need to deliver financial efficiencies. And as I think the government's amendment also recognises, we need to address funding pressures at their root with progressive financial and fiscal planning necessary to ensure investment in Scotland's health, care and wider public services. I believe NHS boards must be given greater ability to deliver long-term budget planning. My amendment, which wasn't selected uh, for debate today, called for that. Audit Scotland has often recommended a more long-term approach to financial planning across the health service. Last year, they said, driven by one-year funding allocations from the Scottish Government and the need to break even each year, this short-term approach makes it difficult for boards to plan and invest in longer-term policy aims, aims we all share. I know the Government intends to bring forward a financial framework for health and social care, but boards need more adaptability in their own right. In 2016, Audit Scotland recommended providing NHS boards with more financial flexibility, such as three-year rolling budgets, rather than annual financial targets. They've also suggested reducing the pressure on boards to break even each year, stressing that even a small amount of flexibility at the financial year end can make a difference. And in November, the Health and Sport Committee published its report looking ahead to the draft budget. Many witnesses stressed the need for a more sophisticated budget process. COSLA said that a short-term input-focused budget process is an inhibitor to genuine reform. And the Royal College of Nursing said 
the constant annual cycle requiring budgets to break even doesn't allow the step change that we all seek and is desperately needed and I urge the Cabinet Secretary to act on this advice. The committee's report also found that scrutiny of integration authority budgets proved very challenging as there was, and I'm quoting, little by way of information available on their financial position, even at the most basic level. Now, given this astonishing lack of transparency, I agree it's wholly appropriate to hold a progress review of integrated joint boards. We must afford Parliament greater opportunity to scrutinise the financial reporting, external audit and governance of the health service and social care system. And if my amendment had been selected for debate today, it would have called directly for that additional scrutiny. And as part of that review of integrated joint boards, we should be considering new ways of supporting local services which contribute so much to our health and social care system. I'm confident that a review of integration authority finances and oversight of the challenges they face will clearly indicate the need for local tax reform. Local authority budgets are under pressure, as we know, hampered by the out-of-date regressive council tax. If we're really serious about an integrated approach to health and social care, we can't simply focus on NHS budgets every time we have a debate about strains on our health service. Uh, yes. John Scott. Would such a review as you're talking about, had your amendment been accepted, and thank you for taking my intervention, have included your concerns about the 494,123 days lost to the health service through bed blocking? And does she, is she happy that her party is supporting the government in this view? Alison Johnson. It's absolutely essential. If we review this issue in the round, we'll see that the pressures on local authorities make it difficult for the change that we need to see delivered in social care. If local authorities were better supported, we would see more social care delivered in our communities. That would make a significantly positive impact on what's happening in our health service directly. So absolutely. Um, I, I, certainly. Neil Finlay. Uh, yeah, the member, members plan for uh, better support and better finance for local government. Can she maybe explain why she voted for the budget? Alison Johnson. I, I voted for the budget precisely because I care about local government and I could not countenance sitting back, shouting from the sidelines and doing precisely nothing. Um, <laughs> presiding officer, as I was saying, we have to look to local authority finances too and give communities new opportunities to prioritise key services like social care. More progressive local taxation won't only benefit health and social care, but public health too. Being bold on local tax reform, as Naomi Eisenstadt recommended, will have important implications, particularly for working households at or just above the poverty line. And the government's amendment recognises that that progressive financial and fiscal planning is needed to sustain our health and social care service. On recruitment challenges, I've made the point that we really need to open up access to medical training medical training places to students from low income backgrounds. I know that many of our universities are leading excellent work on this, but I worry that the government is focused too narrowly on increasing application from the most deprived postcodes in Scotland. It's not right that a student from a low income background might miss out on widening access opportunities because they don't live in a priority postcode or they don't go on to a target school. So I'd ask for a broader approach on that. I'd also like to see this parliament work together to, to tackle drug price inflation. Presiding officer, um, I think we must take it as a given that the Cabinet Secretary is accountable for NHS governance and performance. Indeed, the Cabinet Secretary has made it clear that she wouldn't have it any other way. Greens will support the motion and both amendments today um, at decision time. I think, demands, I think demands in both the opposition motion and amendment are reasonable and the government must take action to realise these. There's absolutely no room for complacency. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Johnson. I call Alec Cole Hamilton, please. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, I'm grateful to the Conservative Party for bringing this motion to Parliament today. I am dismayed, however, that given the coverage and national outrage that was met with the uh, Tayside, NHS Tayside scandal over Easter, that this debate has to fall in opposition time and wasn't brought forward in terms of uh, government debating time so that this Parliament could have given it the full oversight it deserves. Miles Briggs rightly pointed out, reminded the Chamber, 
I will give way to the Cabinet Secretary. Cabinet Secretary. Just to Secretary. remind uh, Cole Hamilton that I did come and make a statement uh, on the issues of NHS Tayside, which gave members an opportunity to ask any questions that they wanted at that point. And we are waiting for reviews. Happy to come back to Parliament once we have those reviews. Alec Cole Hamilton. I, I freely accept that. I welcomed the statement at the time, but it did not give the fulsome analysis that the, this Parliament deserves and the other health boards that this, this, these issues affect uh, in as much. Now, Miles Briggs reminded the Chamber, and it is a matter of public record, that I have called for the Cabinet Secretary's resignation. It is not a view that I came to lightly, and I take no joy in it. I have an immense amount of personal respect for the Cabinet Secretary. But, as Miles Briggs reminded the Chamber, there are light bulbs flashing all over the dashboard of our NHS in warning of the many problems that it faces. And this Cabinet Secretary and her government have repeatedly ignored the will of this Parliament in things like service redesign, particularly around the closure of local hospitals Wards. They have met, been met with a string of missed targets highlighted by the Audit Scotland uh, report. And it is, though, the events of Easter that were the very much the straw that broke the camel's back for my party in respect of the idea that we can go this far and no further. In, a, in, an, in a, an NHS Tayside, we saw that uh, not only was there an element of cooking the books where 5.3 million pounds of digital health money was recycled to make those books look more healthy, we saw the revelations of charitable donations which were given to that health board for things like patient comfort and other uh, extraneous purchases being used to plug gaps in their IT system to the point where they now have a 44.1 million pound shortfall. And I learned that this week we're seeing a ban on GPs prescribing paracetamol as a means of make it making that gap. Such is the, the nature of the abject distress that Health Board is in. That was met with a response whereby the, the chair of that uh, Health Board, Professor Connell, was managed out. He was asked to resign. Now, I was intemperate in my response to that Deputy Presiding Officer. I thought that was right. It was right that somebody should take responsibility. Only then did I learn that Professor Connell had actually, uh, that, well, the events that led to his departure had predated his tenure there. Such is the nature of this Cabinet Secretary looking for a full guy in this case. I will give way again to the Cabinet, Cabinet Secretary. Secretary. The member on that point will recognise that this predated my term in office as well, but I'm taking responsibility for it. Alec Cole Hamilton. Why so, you so perhaps in your closing, perhaps in the Cabinet Secretary's remarks at the end of at the end of the debate, we just can... a wee, just a wee minute. I can't hear anything. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Then perhaps the Cabinet Secretary might want to address exactly what he wasn't doing fast enough, which led to his resignation, and whether she can extend comfort to chairs of other NHS boards who might be worried that they have to take the fall for this government, irrespective of who the Cabinet Secretary was at the time. And then we hear, as Miles Briggs rightly points out, that NHS Lothian, my own home health board, £31 million adrift of spending of where it needs to be to keep services at 2017 levels. Now, I'm very grateful for the Labour Party for bringing their amendment today because it does widen this debate. This isn't just about finance. It's absolutely about the linear, the absolute litany of missed targets within this health service. We saw the impact of poor government policy measured out in the fact that a 23% cut to ADPs, alcohol and drug partnerships in this country, has led to the highest drug-related deaths in Europe. Absolutely scandalous. And it is at times like this that we need to turn to this government and say your, your government and your party have been found wanting. In bed blocking, in the fact that on any given night in this country 1,000 people will be staying in hospital beds when they are fit to go home because there is inadequate social care coverage for them to go back to. Now I want to pay tribute to the Cabinet Secretary. I want to thank her for taking up the case of William Valentine who I raised with her in the committee yesterday. I'm grateful for the correspondence I received. But William is just one of 1,000 people who in any given day are spending more time in hospitals than they require and that causes an interruption in flow throughout the rest of our health service which sees elective surgical operations cancelled, which sees four hour waiting times in A&E absolutely never achievable because there are no inpatient beds for those people in acute receiving units to be received into. And it is... 
I will, if I have time. John Mason. I thank the member for giving way. Can he tell us what he's arguing for? Is he arguing for a reduced budget for the health service and more for local authorities so that they can provide more uh, care at home? Is that what he wants? I'm, Alec Colham. I'm very grateful for the member setting me up for this point. There is no, in the national performance framework, the health outcome in our national performance framework, the, the indicators underpinning it contain not one reference to social care. And it is the landscape of social care in this country which is the problem. We are not paying our social care workers enough. There is not enough provision within the sector. And as a result, people are languishing in hospital when they should be in their communities. And I will finish on the, on the point around uh, mental health, because I always come back to mental health, because it is a national outrage. In, if your child were to fall off her bike and break her arm, you could be, expect her to be in plastic by the, end of the by the end of the day. But if she was to, uh, to come to you with anxiety or depression or eating disorders, any other kind of mental health problem, you can expect her to join one of the longest queues in our health service. And that is a national outrage. And it's not just child and adolescent mental health, it's adult mental health as well. James Jopling from the Samaritans just this very morning responded to the National Suicide Action Plan by saying, and this is an, a, an astonishing assertion from the director of the Samaritans in Scotland, that this government just isn't taking suicide seriously. We were waiting a year longer than we should have for that action plan, and it has been found severely wanting. So this government needs a whole systems change approach to our health service, and unfortunately for my party, that change now starts at the top. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. I now move to the open debate. Liz Smith to be followed by Ash Denham. Ms Smith, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I think everyone in this chamber can agree that the creation of the NHS 70 years ago was one of this country's greatest achievements, mainly because it was a universal service based on clinical need rather than on patients' income. With the passage of time, however, these needs have changed, in some cases beyond all recognition, and with them the ability of the NHS to deliver on its founding principles. Demographic changes are obviously largely the issue, but so too, ironically, is the success of the NHS. With many more people living so much longer as a result of vastly improved treatments, the challenge of delivering universal care will always be one of those most difficult confronting any government. And there are also many more people living longer with chronic ill health, and that includes mental health. Many experts and health professionals believe that this makes the case for integrated health and social care incontrovertible. In particular, we need to find ways to ensure that older people do not overstay their time in hospital if they can be looked after at home and in their communities. And it's hard to argue against that, which is why no political party is in the way of integrated service approach. The debate, however, is raging about how that integrated approach should be managed. And it's in this context that we are challenging the SNP this afternoon on its record. And I want to use the example of recent issues with NHS Tayside to give substance to my argument. Now, I have no doubt that the very serious problems which have been exposed with NHS Tayside and indeed other boards in recent weeks will have a long way to run until the detail is uncovered about who authorised some really bad decisions including the misuse of charitable endowment funds, something that has rightly appalled the public. Both the official inquiries and the spotlight from the media will eventually spill the beans on who knew what, when, and who made the mistakes. And it's not for me to comment on that until these inquiries report. However, in the meantime, the current controversy has shown up other issues about the SNP's running of NHS boards. How can it be right that those trustees who sit on the boards are responsible for overseeing the spending of taxpayers' money and also being responsible for overseeing the spending of charitable donations given by patients and their families. Of course. Cabinet Secretary. I, I think Liz Smith raise, raises a very important point, one that she's raised in this chamber before, and I hope she'll acknowledge that, I've, as I've said to her before, Oscar have already signalled that they want to work on the guidance and look at those governance issues, because I agree, I think that has to be fundamentally changed. Liz Smith. Uh, well, I, I'm very glad to hear that, Cabinet Secretary, because I think there are very serious questions that have to be answered about this. And I have to say, when the reports come in, as it's, it's not for me to comment just now, but I think there will be serious questions about the workings uh, of the Oscar process and about the way that the Scottish Government oversees a lot of the financial management of the NHS. Because these are the issues, especially when it comes to dealing with charitable endowments, a period of four years elapsed before any real action was taken. 
And in a letter to one of my constituents, Oscar confirmed that it did not know, it did not know about the NHS Tayside scandal until the 4th of April. And it looks as though the Scottish Government might not have been aware of the issue until around that time. So that begs the question, how can four years go past? And I know it's a topic that uh, Jenny Mara has taken up with the Audit Committee too. That, Cabinet Secretary, is inexcusable. Cabinet Secretary. Liz Smith agree with me that there are lessons to be learned for all of us, including the auditing processes, because it's important that issues like that are flagged and qualified in reports that come to the Scottish Government or any other public body. Liz Smith. Y yes, I do, but I think the government has to understand its responsibility in that context too. Now, may I uh, go on to the issue of uh, IGBs? Because I do not believe, and the Cabinet Secretary has a letter from me uh, about this, I do not believe that the AGB IGBs have clear lines of responsibility. There appears to be an inequity in the balance between the health and the social services expertise and the tendering process, which allows third sector organisations to play their part in assisting with the provision of services. It is not, Cabinet Secretary, working well. And it puts councillors uh, in a, an impossible situation in some cases when they serve on an IGB and it undermines the accountability which all our constituents should expect from their local health boards. And after speaking with uh, several councillors, NHS officials and patients, it would appear that there are very considerable concerns about the functioning of IGBs, something which I am led to believe that the Cabinet Secretary has been told by members of her own party. Some very senior health officials are making the point that they find it difficult to know who has ultimate responsibility for many decisions within health and social care with the result that there is this lack of accountability. Now, I hope the seriousness of these concerns will lead you, Cabinet Secretary, to authorise a full review of the IGB as they have functioned in their first two years, to examine the issues which have been raised and to make the necessary changes which will ensure that both our health and social care services are fully equipped to deal with the extensive demands made upon them. As was mentioned before, the running of the health service will never ever be easy, but it would surely be given a better chance if ministers can get a grip on what is really long, wrong in that management process. And in that respect, Cabinet Secretary, I really do think it is a very urgent and pressing issue. And I obviously support the motion in the name of Miles Briggs. Thank you very much. I call Ash Denham to be followed by Edward Mountain. Ms Denham, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Scottish Government acknowledges that there is still progress to be made within the NHS. It's open about this, and rightly so. And the Cabinet Secretary has been similarly open about the situation in NHS Tayside recently, addressing it, putting in place measures to resolve it in a timely way and to support positive change moving forward. So we now know that new leadership is in place, um, having approved the appointment of an experienced interim chair and working with NHS Scotland to appoint a new acting chief executive. An independent investigation by Grant Thornton has been commissioned and the Scottish Government is also providing ongoing support to the board through the transformation support team. The Scottish Government is also developing a medium term financial framework to support national, regional and local financial planning for the next five years. And this will, among other things, outline the broad direction for the NHS and care services to meet the changing needs of the people of Scotland, including shifting the balance of care towards community health services. But there is a wider point to be made here, I think, about working towards, as I believe we are, the very highest standards of organisational governance in the public sector. So to improve levels of things like public engagement, things like transparency and decision making, and in the case of health boards, diversity on boards <laughs> and ongoing training and support to members of boards so that they can carry out what is a very demanding role um, well. So the Health and uh, Sport Committee recently looked at governance in the NHS and some of the board members who came in to give evidence to us did express frustration over how difficult a role it was to fulfill effectively and that a greater level of training and support um, could be given to them as well as more opportunities to learn from what is working well in other board areas. And I believe that they were constructive comments. And now I turn to the Conservative motion. The Conservative motion today makes mention of the financial pressures on the NHS, but it fails to make the obvious connection to the source of that pressure that they are a direct result of the austerity policies enforced on the UK and Scotland by the UK government in Westminster. Under the Conservative Party's misguided ideological approach, and let us never forget that austerity is a choice abandoned now by countries across Europe, I will, 
Liz Smith. I, I thank the member for taking uh, the intervention in pre preparation for today's speech. I looked through a lot of the evidence uh, for the Health and Sport Committee and various other health professionals. Not once was it mentioned about UK government issues. It was mentioned about the structures and the spending issues here in Scotland. Ash Denham. But the Conservative motion explicitly makes reference to financial pressures on our public services, and that's what I'm addressing here. And we know that the block grant is being affected by declining amounts of money to Scotland from Westminster. And I would like to know when the Conservatives in this chamber will concede the effects of their own policies Please on down. Scottish Please families across the country. Until we do that, we cannot have a sensible conversation about any of this. <laughs> this the Scottish Government has faced an 8% cut to its discretionary budget over 10 years, worth £2.6 in real terms. The block grant from the UK Government for day-to-day -day spending over the next two years is projected to fall by £500 million. And so the Scottish Conservatives are right to draw attention to these cuts and to the financial burden that it places on the Scottish Government to deliver its ambitious plans for the NHS in Scotland. But they fail to explain, again, how they would do anything differently in this matter. The Scottish Government has and continues to mitigate these cuts and protect and prioritise our NHS. An increase to the health portfolio resource budget this year by more than 400 million, taking it to a record high of over 13.1 billion investing two billion more in health resource spending by the end of this parliament, the highest investment commitment of any party in this chamber. Increasing support for primary care by a further 500 million over this parliament. And these commitments are enabled by an ambitious budget that prioritizes our NHS and aims to create a Scotland that is fairer, more equal and more prosperous. And it is a budget that both parties on either side of this chamber failed to back. This budget is an exercise in the Scottish Government using its devolved powers to, perfect, to protect investment in our NHS. And it's delivering that. An additional 867 million for investment in public services that otherwise would not have been available. And if I remember it correctly, um, the Tories have made over 100 demands for increased public spending yep. while also demanding a 500 million pound tax giveaway to high earners and businesses it didn't add up then, and it doesn't add up now. Um, in conclusion, presiding officer, I'd like to tell the story that I found this morning on care opinions about a patient that was in a hospital in my constituency, which is Edinburgh Royal Infirmary. Um, and so to quote, my dad was in Ward 106, base A for his last few weeks. And I just wanted to say how amazing all of the staff were. Not only did they look after him, and gave him great treatments. They were also very friendly and understanding. They were very patient with my dad, even when he was delirious and when he was causing them a lot of work. They were all amazing people, and I couldn't have asked for anyone better to look after my dad in his last few days. I know that he was treated well and with great respect and care. So for the parties in this parliament to come to the chamber without any or many constructive um, suggestions for how to improve the health service isn't credible. It's not the serious approach that this subject and that Scotland also deserves. Thank you. I call Edward Mountain to be followed by Stuart McMillan. Mr Mountain, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. There's been much talk already this afternoon about NHS Tayside, but it's not just NHS Tayside because my mailbag is full of letters from constituents who are rightly scared about the future of local health provision. The time for excuses, especially in the Highlands, is definitely over. Why? Well, because we seem to lurch from one crisis to another, and enough is definitely enough. Let me be clear. Closing wards, centralising services definitely comes at an expense, an expense to the care of patients. And it's not the suspension in the Highlands of out-of-hours care services in Portree Hospital. Then it's the downgrading of wards like the Caithness Maternity Unit. It's not the reduction of beds of New Craig's Psychiatric Hospital, then it's cuts to the palliative care and psychiatric care in Badnock and Straths Bay. And if it's not the fact that more operations are being centralised in Ragmore when patients could be treated in hospitals such as the one at Goldsby, 
then it's the constant threat of closures that hang over the town and county hospital in Wick and the Dunbar Hospital in Thurso. And it doesn't stop there. There are cancellations of hospitals in Ragmoor due to about just about every reason imaginable. There's failure to meet 12-week waiting time targets for cancer patients, a shortage of DPs across the Highlands, and increasing local costs. I could go on and on and on. Such shameful leadership of NHS Highland means that patients are not receiving the standard of care they're entitled to. No, I'm afraid I'm short of time and I want to give way to the Cabinet Secretary in a minute. So let's see if she's going to, to, to ask. And if she doesn't, maybe Mr Arthur, I'll let you in. So we know at this stage there's about £15 million of overspend in the 2017-18 in the Highlands. We also know of the maladministration of health contracts. And these issues all have the underlying theme of mismanagement and lack of leadership. Now, if the Scottish Government truly had confidence in the management of NHS Highland, then why did it commission John Brown to undertake a review of the corporate governments of the Health Board? No, Cabinet Secretary, that's not the one I'm going to let you come in on. <laughs> there are questions being asked. And here we go, Cabinet Secretary, here's your moment. Let's try the simple question, Cabinet Secretary. Does the Scottish Government think it's acceptable that NHS contracts that have been awarded have not been audited for 20 years. Would you, would you like me to give way on that? Would you like to come in on that? I'd, I'd like Cab to uh, wait a minute, points. Cabinet Secretary. I have to call you first. Cabinet Secretary. Yes. Uh, on both of those points, you'll be aware, the member will be aware that one of those contracts dated back to 1998, and no, and that is not acceptable, and NHS Highland themselves have said it's not acceptable, and will act on the recommendations of Audit Scotland. Uh, on the other issue of John Brown doing the governance review, the governance review in Highland is a pilot about strengthening governance within our NHS, started in Highland, the lessons to be learned elsewhere. Surely that's something he would welcome. Edward Mountain. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First of all, I'm delighted that Cabinet Secretary believes that handing over money for 20 years with no record of outcomes is unacceptable. And as far as the John Brown uh, review of governance is, I'm going to wait to see what he says before I actually comment on what he's actually uh, produced. Now, let's just go back to that. Because Audit Scotland, when it came to contracts, recently condemned NHS Highland, saying contract monitoring was inconsistent, informal and not documented and concluded that NHS Highland couldn't demonstrate the achievement of value for money. Apparently, when it came to it, they couldn't even list the names of the patients who'd undergone treatment. That's a pretty damning verdict, one that shows how far the management of NHS Highland's audit committee is. Now, NHS Highland's promised to fix that and to monitor their performance via their own audit committee. So the audit committee that's dysfunctional will audit itself I'm struggling with that one, Cabinet Secretary, I really am. Surely if there's a problem, you put it out to somebody else to find out what the true extent of the problem is and then resolve it. So real change is needed. And I'd like to join with Miles Briggs in calling for more parliamentary scrutiny over NHS finances. And I urge the Scottish Government to publish the current financial body, uh, position of all NH boards, NHS boards. The public have a right to know the scale of the financial crisis not only affecting the NHS, but NHS Highland, and how that will impact on the standard of care they can expect to receive. We already know that NHS Highland has been tasked by the Scottish Government to find £100 million of savings by 2020. But how is that going to be achievable when they fail to achieve the savings that they needed this year and have had to seek £15 million of brokerage for next year? So that means that not only they'll have to find the £15 million of savings they failed to find this year, they'll also probably have to find the money that the Scottish Government is lending them. On top of that, that means more pain, more pain for the people who are expecting services that they're not getting. No, I'm in my the last The member's minute. coming into his last few seconds. So does that mean for our health service in the Highlands and Islands? It means probably closing more wards, centralising local services, which I don't believe is the answer. Presiding officer, in times of adversity, our doctors, our nurses and our healthcare professionals who continue to work harder than ever before are being let down by the management of the NHS in Highland and I believe by the Scottish Government. It's not too late for NHS Highland and the Scottish Government to improve the financial health of our NHS, but it will take good leadership, something that we don't seem to have. And I believe it's time for change. And, I, and somebody 
needs to rise to the challenge of this, and I just wonder who that's going to be. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I call Stuart McMillan to follow by Neil Finlay. Mr McMillan, please. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, um, there's a few points that have been raised today regarding obviously finance and also challenges. Now, obviously, in the, the amendment put forward by Anna Sawa, uh, it, it speaks about the, the finances and Alison Johnson and her comments and Edward Mounter's comments a few moments ago uh, touch upon it as well. But uh, and the issue of brokerage uh, has been raised. Now, the issue of, of brokerage, brokerage is not new. That's something that's been in the NHS, NHS system for some time. And certainly, if you go back to the 2007 uh, and the audit committee of this parliament and the work that this, commi that this uh, committee undertook regarding the, the situation of NHS Western Isles, the issue of brokerage was something that was utilised to try to get that particular health board into a situation uh, that was actually, once again, manageable as compared to the mess that it was in. Now, Miles Briggs talks about uh, challenges. Now, I think the one point that I will agree with Miles Briggs on is in terms of challenges, that there always have been challenges in the NHS, there are challenges now, and there always will be challenges in the future. And I think as the, as the Cabinet Secretary it said in her, in her opening comments, with an organisation of the size of the NHS in Scotland, then clearly there will always be challenges that will come up from time to time. And I think I mean, that's something across the, this chamber we can all agree on. And certainly, uh, I think, but one point I think that, uh, that is also extremely important is, is if politicians from all sides are actually going to be fair and uh, if they genuinely recognise the success stories as well as the challenges that the health boards and the government accordingly uh, face, then I think it's an important aspect of the health journey However, it's to actually learn the lessons of the past and also work to deliver the service so that it actually doesn't make those same mistakes going forward. So I'm going to touch upon some positives as well as some of the challenges. First of all, on uh, the positives, faced, faced with the £2.6 billion of Tory cuts over the 10 years, including the £200 million cut to day-to-day -day spending uh, this coming year, this Scottish Government is using the devolved powers to protect investment in our NHS. The Scottish Government is fully funding the NHS uh, with a £400 million increase in spending for the health year. Uh, and uh, changes to tax, well, just one moment, and changes to tax mean that they don't uh, have to reduce other spending, uh, other services uh, to back uh, the NHS. The budget is now £13.1 billion, pounds, and I'll take your intervention. Miles Briggs. Member for taking that intervention, both himself and Ash Denham have misread the chamber in the sense of the funding changes in both England and Scotland. NHS funding in Scotland is growing at half the rate of the increase in England, and had health spending under this government kept pace, we would have seen an extra £1 billion a year in our health service. That's the facts and truth which members need to actually uh, tell people in this chamber. Stuart McMillan. Well, Miles Briggs should know that every penny that's actually came to Scotland has actually went into the NHS. Now, if Miles Briggs wants to say something otherwise, then I think he's been disingenuous to this Parliament and also disingenuous to the electorate in, in Scotland. Uh, there's also another element in terms of the, in terms of the finance. Uh, this, um, the, the amounts actually uh, mean that it's an uplift of 3.4% in cash terms and also 1.9% in real terms. And certainly according to the Scottish Fiscal, Com Scottish Fiscal Commission, the changes to the draft budget announced at stage one of the budget bill will raise £290 million in 2018 19 to support public services and Scotland's economy. Now, presiding officer, a uh, second point was that in March, March saw an un unseasonably cold weather with Scotland's first ever red weather alert across large swathes of the country. And uh, the, the army providing assistance to get staff and patients to and from hospitals through deep snow. In total, 25,399 operations took place in March 2018, compared to 23,664 in the previous month. That's a 7.3% rise. And I think uh, this, this chamber should actually be saying well done to our hard-working NHS staff for their dedication and also even more the fact they actually fought through the snow to get into the work uh, through the dangerous weather conditions to actually deliver these services. And thirdly, and only last week, a report to Inverclyde Council's Health and Social Care Committee highlighted Inverclyde's performance in ensuring uh, people spend the minimum time in a hospital bed when they're ready to be discharged is among the best in Scotland. The report also uh, marked, just uh, one wee moment, the report also marked a reduction in bed days lost, that's the number of days individuals are waiting to be discharged. And the chair of the committee, that's Labour's councillor Robert Moran, is quoted as saying, this is excellent news for patients, families and carers. The council, uh, through the Inverclyde Health and Social Care Partnership, have made delayed discharge a priority to ensure older people do not spend longer than they need in hospital.
Briefly, Ms Bailey, as of course, members uh, come to the end of I'm this I'm delighted time. to hear the member praising a Labour council, and I'm sure they will enjoy that too. I wonder whether he would comment on the fact that there are £90 million worth of repairs required at Inverclyde Royal. What's he doing to progress that? Stuart McMillan. Uh, I think, as, the, as my constituents will know, I, I'm on record as saying, uh, and I think anyone uh, in this chamber would actually understand, that no building is going to last forever. There, there will have to be uh, either whether it's the repairs onto the building or whether it's going to be a new hospital at some point in the future. Now, I mean, the fact the building was built uh, where it is on the top of a hill uh, is absolutely was, was a, a ridiculous situation that took place at the time. And so, but, uh, um, a final positive point is and the fact that with, with, the, 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 with the great news uh, of uh, uh, the new Greenwich Health Centre that's going to be built, uh, that's going to progress this year, and also with uh, the official opening of the, the replacement Ravenscray Hospital, that's the, the Orchard View uh, that took place last year. Now, unfortunately, uh, I've, uh, that's the positive. I've not got time for the challenges because of the interventions, but certainly, presiding officer, I, mean, I think, uh, and I'm sure that any fair-minded MSP in this chamber will recognise that every single health board has to live within their means. Uh, and we only have to look back to NHS Argyll and Clyde under the shambles uh, that was the Labour Lib Dem Scottish Executive when it had to, when it had to be disbanded uh, and also had to have £82.3 million put in to plug its debt. Then also the NHS Western Isles shambles, which uh, Murdo Fraser was on the committee and Claire Baker was on the committee uh, and, uh, with uh, the shambles, that that actually was the case as well. So, presenting officer, I will take absolutely no lessons whatsoever from Labour and the Lib Dems and also the Tories with the mess that they're having uh, with the NHS down south. I'll take no lessons from them because I know, although there are challenges and there will continue to be challenges in the NHS in Scotland, but I do know that it's only this SNP government that actually has the NHS in Scotland uh, at its forefront and will certainly deliver for the people of Scotland. Thank you. Thank you. Just before I call Mr Finlay, can I remind members if you intervene, you must press your request to speak button again, please. You're not listening to Miss Bailey, it's for you. Thank you very much. I call, I call Neil Finlay to be followed by Claire Hockey, please. Uh, thanks, President Officer, and can I declare an interest in that my wife works for the NHS. And uh, I hear from her every day about the good that goes on in the health service. And, uh, but I have to say the Scottish Government are very skilled at PR when it comes to the NHS in Scotland. The First Minister is often seen, uh, along with the Cabinet Secretary, out and about uh, with the cameras when there are good news stories. Rightly so. You'd be forgiven for thinking, though, that the NHS in Scotland was streets ahead and a beacon of best practice for everyone else to follow. But sadly, the reality is often very different. For every MSP in this parliament, the NHS must be at or near the top of their post bag. Week in, week out, at question time and in the media, we see MSPs of all parties raising cases and concerns about health and social care. Because any waiting times are growing, cancer, cancer waiting times are again not being met. Last year, 16,000 people waited one hour for an emergency ambulance. Scotland has the highest level of drug deaths in Europe, three times the level of elsewhere in the UK, and 363 bed days, uh, thousand bed days in Lothian were lost last year due to delayed discharge. And before we hear any more patronising nonsense about talking down the NHS or undermining staff, let me say this. It's the staff themselves who are raising many of these issues with us because they're burnt out, they're shattered, they're under pressure and stress like never before in their careers. They're the ones who care most of them and have invested their career in the NHS and we have a duty to stand up for them and be their voice in this parliament. So let me focus on how things are impacting on people on the ground. In Lothian, patients are having to wait 44 weeks just to see an orthopaedic specialist. Not for treatment, merely for a consultation. One of my constituents who works in the gym was forced off work with a leg injury and waited so long for an appointment that her employer was threatening her with the sack. She is far from alone. I have many orthopaedic cases in my constituency caseload. I see patients moving into new communities, unable to register at their local GP because 40% of lists in Lothian are closed. I have a relative who at the moment is in St John's and is ready and wants to go home but can't because she's waiting on a package of care. That bed space could be freed up for another patient. 1.6 million bed days like this have been lost since the Cabinet Secretary said 
that she would eradicate delayed discharge. We're rapidly heading for the first anniversary of the closure of the St John's Children Ward to inpatients out of hours. Parents are having to drive if they have a car. Their sick and injured children pass their local hospital to Edinburgh because the ward is closed at evening and weekends. The RAH Children's Ward has already closed. President Officer, we all know that general practice is so critical to the well-being of the NHS, yet it is in crisis. According to the Royal College of GPs, there is a short shortage of 856 GPs across the country. Just last night, in the village of Stonyburn in my region, a village of just 2,000 people, 300 residents turned out to a public meeting to protest with one voice about the proposal to leave the village with no GP provision. That's more than one in seven of the population. Like many other practices across the country, the local GPs are retiring and there are zero, zero applicants to take over. Ten years ago, I'm told there would have been a dozen applicants. Now, none. So what does this mean for local people? Well, if you have a car, you can travel. If you don't, there's no footpath to walk, so you need to use the very poor and infrequent bus service at a cost of four pounds a return. Seven if you have a sick child with you. Cabinet Secretary, I have to say, for the people in this position, healthcare is no longer going to be free at the point of need. This is an abject failure of long-term planning and general practice across Scotland by successive health secretaries. The age profile of GPs surely can't have been a surprise to the government. We have a system at the moment that would collapse without locum cover, which is costing around £500 a day in Lothian, £850 a day in Lanarkshire, and in Orkney, they're paying up to an eye-watering £1,400 a day for locum, co locum cover to try and keep the system going. Add to this the millions lost through increased use of agencies that charge extortionate amounts, and is it any wonder that health board finances are at a critical level. President officer, the government stewardship of our NHS has been dreadful. In the past, a first minister resigned because of an issue with an office lease. Stuart Stevenson resigned because it snowed. Today we've got a cabinet secretary overseeing the worst waiting times on record, delayed discharge increasing, a crisis in general practice, wars being closed, NHS fin finances in such a state they're robbing the charity box to try and keep services going. And yet she retains the confidence of the First Minister. The government likes to claim credit for good things. Now the Minister and the government must accept responsibility for the bad. Thank you. I call Claire Hockey to be followed by Annie Wells. Ms Hockey, please. Thank you, President Officer, and I would like to uh, begin by referring members to my entry in the Register of Interest in that I'm a registered mental health nurse and currently hold an honorary contract with NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. As a mental health nurse who has worked in the NHS for over two decades, I'm very well aware of the challenges it's facing today. Thankfully, our population are now living longer due to advances in medical treatments and care, and therefore the pressures and demands on our NHS are growing. And to meet the challenges our health service is facing, this Scottish Government have undertaken major reforms by integrating health and social care, as well as investing record levels in our NHS, topping £13 billion this year, in spite of ongoing Tory austerity. Presiding officer, today's Conservative motion references how financial difficulties are being faced by health boards across Scotland. And this is, of course, true. However, I would go much further. Financial problems are being experienced in Northern Ireland, in Tory-run England and Labour-run Wales NHS. The challenges faced by the NHS Ayrshire, Tayside and Lothian are not unique to Scotland. And by way of example, in England, 83% of acute hospital trusts were in deficit to the tune of £1.5 billion, according to figures released in September last year. The Howaldha Health Board in Wales, which serves Carmarthen and Pembrokeshire, has a budget deficit of around £69 million. And the largest health board in Wales is also subject to a charity cash probe. 
And being a healthcare professional myself, I fully appreciate the concerns of the public and politicians regarding the spending of charitable donations in NHS Tayside. It's imperative that health boards use such money appropriately and for their intended purposes. The inquiry into the Tayside Endowment Fund by the OSCR is the correct step. And rightly, NHS Tayside have proactively agreed to repay the money to the Endowment Fund. If any expenditure in any health board across Scotland is deemed to be inappropriate, then I agree with the Scottish Government in that it must be paid back to the charitable funds from which it came. And I hope the opposition parties will join me in welcoming the request made by the Scottish Government to the Chief Executive of NHS Scotland to write to every NHS board chair seeking assurance that endowment monies are being spent for the correct purposes. When this issue was brought to the attention of the Cabinet Secretary, she took immediate action for which the Conservative motion is calling. She has taken the decisive step to replace the NHS Tayside leadership team. She has authorised further brokerage to the Health Board and the Scottish Government is continuing to work to improve governance and organisational performance across the public sector. Presiding officer, I had hoped that today's debate would have been one in which proposals and ideas would have been forthcoming from opposition parties about how we can improve governance and the performance of our NHS. But instead, it is merely sought to add to the witch hunt against the government. Both Labour and the Conservatives have been incredibly predictable. When a challenge faces the government, rather than suggesting reasonable proposals and working with them, they revert to the only two things they know. Call for the government to spend more money and urge resignations. It's noticeable that the it Scottish It would seem clear that Ms Hawkey is not taking interventions. I will further on, uh, presiding officer. It's noticeable that the Scottish Conservatives have been utterly silent on the sham of the health service Jeremy Hunt is presiding over in England. An English NHS, which the Red Cross once described as facing a humanitarian crisis and one which has been rocked by junior doctor strikes. And indeed, the silence has been deafening from Scottish Labour too. The Welsh NHS is consistently amongst the worst performing in the UK. Yet the Cabinet Secretary provided, presiding over it is a favourite to become the next First Minister of that country. I'll take Mr Finlay's intervention. Thank Neil Finlay. Thank you. Um, I, I'm a member of the Scottish Parliament responsible for my constituents here, just as is the member. Um, I wonder if she could tell us what comfort or what advice she could give to the 300 people who came to the public meeting last night in Stonyburn and said that they were not accepting the fact that they would no longer have a GP in their local community. Claire Hawkey. I thank Mr Finlay for his intervention. Do you know, you can't always compare health systems across the world, but you can compare, you can compare health systems across the UK, and the Scottish NHS consistently outperforms uh, every I would like other to hear NHS Ms. Hockey, please. on these islands. The very fact that both parties voted down the Scottish Government's budget early this year shows they're happy to play political football with our health service. This was a budget which would have allocated more than £400 million in additional funding, yet neither voted for it. The fact remains Labour promised less money than the Tories for the NHS at the last Holyrood election. And coupled with Tory austerity, I don't know how either party can keep a straight face when it comes to complaining about health service finances. Presiding officer, I'm resolute in my belief that our NHS is better off in SNP hands. And the proof of this lies in the woeful state of the NHS in England and Wales, where the Tories and Labour are in charge. And yes, they don't want to hear it, but hear it they must. Privatisation by the back door and the front door, trust cancelling weeks of planned surgery and eye-watering waits at a and &E. You would almost think there was a plan to run down this most cherished Can I have some service. quiet, please? So the wholesale privatisation was seen as the only viable alternative. Today's debate comes in the same week as three positive news stories about Scotland's health service. Excuse me, Mr Dornan, you will get your turn shortly. Carry on, Ms Hockey. Part three of the National Health and Care Social Care Workforce Plan was published with seven 
million pounds investment in nurse training, and I warmly welcome that. Scotland's A&E's figures once again shown to be the best in the UK, and this in the week with the Scottish Government's minimum pricing policy has finally come into force. Yes, our health service is under pressure, and yes, particular health boards have more challenges than others, and they must be addressed. But, President Officer, we've not heard from any MSP today why the issues facing particular health boards are the direct fault of the Cabinet Secretary herself, and petty games like this trivialise their politics. We should let the Cabinet Secretary you go on with her close, job please. in improving our NHS, the one which is already outperforming all the others on these islands. Can I remind members that they should always speak through the chair, please? I'm going to have Annie Wells followed by James Dornan. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I am pleased to have the opportunity to speak in today's debate about the severe financial problems facing NHS Scotland. Across Scotland, we are seeing daily articles on financial problems up and down the country, and rightly so, people are very worried. The Scottish Conservatives wish to see a government that has control over health spending and one that promotes financial transparency, which is why I too echo calls made by Miles Briggs. The SNP has been in charge of the NHS in Scotland for over a decade, so it's absolutely right that we shine a light on this issue. Despite the SNP's spin on this, Spending is not keeping pace with increased demand, nor is it keeping pace with increases Scotland has seen in Barnet Consequentials. Health spending in Scotland has increased by just 5% between 2012-13 and 2016-17. I'll take the intervention. Shona Robson. Um, will Annie Wells uh, accept that every single penny of health resource consequentials have been passed on to uh, the health budget in Scotland and indeed more money uh, in addition to that, but will Annie Wells tell us if she thinks more money is needed for the NHS, how much and from where? Annie Wells. Maybe we actually need to look at how the money has been spent within the NHS to make sure that we are focused on the places where it's needed. In my region in Glasgow, spending has stagnated. In the government's draft budget, the NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde, the budget showed a real terms cut of £22.5 million and it was reported that NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde was facing a funding deficit of up to £20 million. Quite clearly, the health board is under huge financial pressure, and this is only being made worse by the mismanagement of the NHS by this SNP government. As confirmed last year's Audit Scotland report, the SNP has failed to effectively plan for the future when it comes to the workforce. One in four GP practices in Scotland have, has a vacancy, for example, and there are over 2,500 nursing and midwifery posts lying vacant. As a result of this, we have seen spending on temporary staff soar. Last year, spending on plugging staff gaps broke the £300 million mark for the first time. From 2014-15, this was an increase of more than £100 million. As a ripple effect, the SNP's failure to provide adequate community care to el for the elderly we have also seen increasingly high levels of bed blocking. In 2016-17, more than half a million bed days were occupied by patients who were fit to leave, the majority of which were elderly. Delayed discharges is estimated to cost £132 million a year, and only yesterday new figures showed a 3% rise in March this year as compared to March 2017. I would argue too that we are seeing little in terms of preventative spending, a move that would ease financial pressures in the long run. When it comes to alcohol and drugs, for example, we've seen a 22% cut to ADP funding, a move described by the BMA as a false economy. In Glasgow, a city which has complex history with drugs and alcohol, we've seen NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde use endowment funding for a proposed safe heroin injecting space money that could have instead been used to get people off these drugs altogether. The impact of this is of course huge, and we can see the effect, un we can see the effect understanding and underfunding has had on performance. Last year, the NHS only met one of its eight key waiting time targets. More than one in eight cancer patients are waiting more than 62 days for urgent, urgent drug treatment and more of a quarter of children are waiting far too long for mental health treatment. Not at the moment, thank you. In Glasgow, um, I'm currently dealing with a case of a young girl with spina bifida who needs an operation which could dramatically change her life 
However, she is having to wait until the end of the year due to lack of consultants. So this means that from March of last year, she's attending A&E on average twice a week. Now that is, not, that is not on Cabinet Secretary. To finish today, I'd like to echo my colleagues' calls for better control and for more transparency when it comes to NHS spending in Scotland. The SNP can no longer bury its head in the sand when it comes to public health spending. We're seeing a health service which is underfunded, understaffed, and simply put, under pressure. It's our hard-working frontline NHS staff right across Scotland who are suffering as a result of the inability to deliver proper investment and resources. They deserve better for the great work they are carrying out. Each day, I'm actually just concluding. They deserve better for the great work that they are carrying out each day in difficult circumstances. And I hope this debate can finally jolt the, the SNP benches into action. I call James Dornan to be followed by Jackie Bailey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I was going to start off by doing one thing, but I think I've just decided to go a, another direction. The, the party to sitting to my left, but politically to my right, party to my right, it's still to my right, uh, call themselves the party of the union. And yet, as soon as there's any comparisons with other parts of the union that they hold so dear, that we are all so much a part of, that both of these parties and uh, the Lib Dems work so hard to keep us together. They go up and smoke. This is not right. This is not. This is nothing to do with it. We're all working under. We're all working under exactly the same. The, the National Health Service may well be in Scottish control, but the budgets. Are, the budgets are dictated by what happens down in Westminster. And if you want to look at what the Tories will do, look like if they were in control of NHS in Scotland, and the only way we can do it is not by what you say, but what, by what you do, then we'll look at what the NHS is like in, in England. And it is an absolute shambles. The BMA himself said that the, 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 MA, the NHS in England is in complete chaos, that there's, there's, uh, the health service could suffer a repeat of scenes, uh, scenes experience during 20, winter 2016. And that would 85, 87.5% of patients would be seen as opposed to the 90 odd percent that's in Scotland. Our, you, we've got the ridiculous station, I haven't even started them yet. We've got, the ridiculous, we've got the ridiculous situation here where the two parties with the worst health service records where they're in power are trying to get rid of the best health secretary in the United Kingdom. And if it wasn't for party politics and petty party politics, you wouldn't be coming to this chamber and blooming demeaning it with, with motions such as this. <laughs> Just last week, we got Ruth Davidson coming and telling us that this was a party that was working in the nationalist interest and not the national interest. I would have thought that she'd have been here today to tell us how that was all wrong. But of course, Labour and the Lib Dems put a stop to that when they said that she was going to be the isolated one when it came to the continuity bill. The few, and, and what, so what happens is, the best way to reunite that unholy trinity is for you to, you to jump in the back of the bandwagon that was started with Willy Rennie and Anna Sarwa Sit down. Sit uh, down. Excuse, excuse me, everyone, I, Mr. Dornan. Pardon? Um, can we speak through the chair, please? Can we cut down on some of the noise? And sh can we remember we should always be courteous to fellow members in this chamber? Please. The, Willie Rennie, Anna Sarwa, fighting over who could be the first to, to demand the sacking of the cabinet secretary. It was unseemly. And to that speech that he made today should be blooming taken out of the records of the Scottish Parliament. It was nothing but scandalous. Now, Labour Party have got a record that nobody could be proud of, not even their mothers and certainly not their founders. And we come to hear the day on a motion that is based on this, the misuse of charity funding. The misuse of charity funding. And if we look at the Labour Party in Wales, we've got a situation, I can't even remember what it's called, our lads, right, uh, serving Betsy Cowell, Cadwallader Health Board in North Wales did exactly what, what the, uh, has been accused of here, but this was agreed by the Welsh Government, which is run by the Labour Party. This was a system, £450,000 of charitable donations was being used for uh, what it is, staff improvements, and they're trying to say to us, 
that we've got it wrong. The health, se the health secretary wasn't in when this was put in place. If she had been, it wouldn't have been put in place the way it was. She's dealing with it in a way that she's been asked to deal with it. And we still get the ridiculous situation where you're asking for her to go for something that is completely out with her, uh, her dealing with it. Yes, of course I will. Well, if it, Alex if Cole Hamilton. I'm, I'm very grateful to the member for giving way. If it isn't this current health secretary's uh, feet at which the blame should rest, is it the former health secretary, by which I mean the first minister of this country? You see, I think the James Dornan. I, I think the difference between you and I, Alec, is, is that I through the chair, always, please. Pardon. Sorry, sorry, President Officer. Sorry. I think the difference between myself and Mr. Cole Hamilton is that I'm all, not always trying to personalise it. <laughs> This is about trying to solve the problem. All seriousness, this is about trying to solve the problem. The Cabinet Secretary has already taken steps. We've seen two absolutely pathetic interventions from those benches, Mr Sarwar, Mr Finlay, nothing that we wouldn't expect from either of the two of them, where all it was about was personal, personal attacks, nothing positive, no, no moves towards improving the health service, but, and refusing to take responsibility for anything that could be, could be laid at their door. This is just another cheap political stunt by the two sides are better together. You weren't in for the beginning, you're not taking part now. The two sides are better together. My apologies, President Officer. The two sides are better together, getting together to try and take Ms. Mara one of the is best not taking it. Uh, cabinet secretaries in this uh, country and one of the best, best health secretary in the United Kingdom. It's nothing but cheap politics. I think we should just rule it out and we should all vote for the SNP amendment. Thank you. I call Jackie Bailey to be followed by John Mason. Presiding officer, I'm not quite sure how I would follow that. Um, but you know, in all seriousness, there doesn't appear to be a day that passes that the NHS is not in the news. And unfortunately, it's not for the enormous achievements we know are made by NHS staff who work so hard to help us get well. Excuse me, Miss Bailey. Can we stop the conversations flying between benches, please? It's very rude. And I'm sure Miss Bailey's got a lot to say. I do indeed, presiding officer. Um, but it is increasingly the fact that the NHS is in the news because they are under-resourced, undervalued and overworked. It is increasingly about the missed targets, the lengthening waiting times and the lack of staff. And it is increasingly about the NHS being failed by this Scottish Government. Of course, there is a financial straitjacket that they are operating in. Audit Scotland identified a real terms cut to the health budget. The Conservatives have focused on financial accountability and transparency, and it is important to cut through the government spin to understand the scale of the challenge faced by health boards across Scotland. A number of speakers have already covered this. So instead, I will focus on the patient's experience of the NHS today. Let's try and see this through their eyes. And can I say as gently as possible, they're not impressed by the sight of the health secretary on television as she was last night, telling everyone that things were improving. Maybe in a parallel universe that might be the case, but not based on my constituents' experience here in the Scottish NHS. Let me tell you about their waiting times. In orthopaedics, urology, ophthalmology, A&E and cancer, their waiting times are all up. Some have been waiting more than a year, crippled with pain, now housebound, as a result that they couldn't get surgery. And we have the absurd situation in my area where access to the Golden Jubilee, minutes down the road, is rationed or indeed denied by NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. There's also the waiting time to see a consultant, never mind the time to get treatment. In ophthalmology in my area, I have constituents with cataracts being told it will be 30 weeks before they can see a consultant, never mind actually get any treatment. And for cancer patients, it is not, not at this stage. For cancer patients, it is heartbreaking. We know, we all know, that early detection, diagnosis and treatment increases people's chances of recovery. Yet even here, targets are not being met. I have raised screening for suspected breast cancer patients with the Cabinet Secretary before. 
This is where patients are referred urgently by GPs because they suspect breast cancer. Clinic appointments are meant to be under 14 days. In practice, they used to be much quicker. Now they're taking over six weeks. This could cost a woman her life. I raised this with you on the 24th of October, 2017. You replied on the 13th of November to reassure me that matters had been Through resolved the chair, please, and Ms. remedial Bailey. action had been taken. I then wrote again, presiding officer, with the same problem on the 11th of December. And the cabinet secretary replied on the 23rd of January. There was no problem. Everything was fine. Cabinet secretary, either you were deliberately misleading or NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde was pulling your leg. I still have constituents just a month ago waiting for six weeks. I wrote again to the cabinet secretary, uh, allow me to finish. I wrote again to NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde and the cabinet secretary on the 19th of March. I have not yet had a response. How many letters will it take before action is taken? And I give way to the cabinet secretary. Shona Robson. Well, I can say to Jackie Bailey that I was absolutely assured that those issues had been resolved. If she's telling me they're not, I will certainly look into it and get back to it as a matter of urgency, as I'm sure she would appreciate. Of course I would. Jackie Bailey. And I very much welcome that commitment because I think it is outrageous for any government to fail women in this way and I regret that there appears to be a degree of complacency when they don't even bother to respond. But can I say how disappointed I was, presiding officer, when I saw that today had been sneaked out a review of cancer waiting times, not with a press release, just sneaked out, and it's truly shocking. Now, it is easy to blame the cabinet secretary, but you know, she's not the boss. It is Nicola Sturgeon's responsibility. It is a failure of leadership by the First Minister that she keeps the Cabinet Secretary in place when she is struggling because Nicola Sturgeon is too scared to have a reshuffle. No, I'll not give way. Presiding officer, it's not just the opposition saying the government is failing the NHS. Audit Scotland have said it too. Perhaps even more politely than we would, the BMA representing doctors and consultants are telling us that the NHS is at breaking point. Patients are contacting their MSPs with heartbreaking stories to complain that they've been let down by a system that's not working and a government in denial. There is no denying the Scottish government's record. 107,000 patients waiting longer in A&E, 3,000 planned operations cancelled, 1.6 million bed days lost due to delayed discharge. I could go on and on. Now I know SNP members like to deflect attention. We've heard it here today, but they can't blame Westminster, or Brexit, or local government, or even Wales. The Scottish government is in charge. Health is devolved. There is no one else to blame but yourselves. And frankly, trotting out the excuse that we are doing better than elsewhere in the UK demonstrates a depressing lack of ambition. Simply accepting that whilst we are bad, we're not the worst isn't good enough for patients in Scotland. The Cabinet Secretary and her government is inhabiting an alternative reality, but her sticking plaster approach to the NHS is letting down staff and patients and needs to stop now. I call John Mason to be followed by Brian Whittle. Hey, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, firstly, I'd like to say something positive about the wording of the motion. And that is that in comparison to some of the others we've seen in the subject, I think the wording is slightly better. This time we're not overusing the word crisis, but we are using a word like problem and challenges have also been mentioned. And I think all of us would accept there are problems and there are challenges. Then we need to consider what is meant by the wording financial problems. Now, I guess there are roughly, a, well, there are several types of financial problems, but that would include an accounting problem something is not recorded properly, or money for one fund has been used elsewhere. Or it could be the amount of money available to the health service is not being used as well or efficiently as it could be. Or it could mean a, another financial problem, which would be that there is not enough money. And if there is not enough money, then we need to consider, is that not enough money for all that we would like to do? Or is it not enough money for all that the health service potentially could do? The reality is our health services could use almost any amount of money. They could always employ more nurses and other staff, replace older equipment, build new buildings, buy new drugs and equipment, 
however expensive, they, let me get on a little further, they might be, but we will never have unlimited resources. So we will always need to choose what our priorities are. For example, should we spend less on hospitals and more on primary care? Should we spend less on physical care and more on mental health? These are not easy choices and they should be clearly made after serious investigation and discussion between health professionals, patient representatives, managers in the health service, politicians, to name but four groups. Now, can I say also how I think we should not allocate resources? What we should not do is put a vulnerable person in the public gallery of this parliament and demand that the cabinet secretary or the first minister immediately provides them with the latest drug or the latest treatment, no matter how expensive that might be or how uncertain the outcomes might be. That, in my opinion, is verging on abuse of vulnerable people and is potentially damaging to the NHS as it risks upsetting the balance of how it is trying to use its resources. Hey, I'm happy to take the intervention. Ryan Whittle. Uh, thank the member for, uh, for taking the intervention. Would, I wonder if the, the member would agree with me that it's very difficult to recruit into the NHS when they're leaving faster at the other end. John Mason. I mean, I mean if, his, if his argument is that it is difficult to forecast how many teachers we'll need in 10 years' time or how many nurses or whatever, yes, I would agree that is difficult to forecast. And at times in the past, we have had either too many nurses or too many teachers, and the complaint has been you're not giving them jobs, eh, and it may be at other times that we do not have enough of these. But that is not a Scottish problem. That is a problem all over and will always, I suggest, be a problem for any government. Now, I note the demand in the motion for the... Very quickly, yes. Stuart McMillan. I thank John Mason for taking the intervention. Does John Mason agree with me that Brexit is actually going to hamper uh, uh, getting more people into the NHS as compared to the situation we currently have? John Mason. Yes, I, I completely agree with that. Uh, now, I note the demand in the motion for, quote, the immediate publication of the current financial position, unquote. And I'm not sure how literally that was meant to be taken or if it was just slightly poor wording. But as an accountant, if I could just comment that from a practical point of view, I am sure members will realise that even with modern technology, it does take time to prepare financial accounts. And the more accurate you want them to be with a balance sheet and valuation of stock and all these things, the longer it will take to get reliable figures. And I note in the Cabinet Secretary's letter to Lewis MacDonald, I think today, that uh, she suggests that uh, the end of June for April and May figures. So I absolutely support transparency in principle, but I would ur urge a little realism on timescales. On the wording of the motion too, it uses the word accountable, which I was checking in the dictionary, and it says something like, quote, required or expected to justify actions or decisions, unquote. Well, that is certainly what is happening today. The cabinet secretary is here, is accountable, is justifying her actions and decisions. She is answering questions in the chamber. So I think, again, the wording of the motion is poor when it says should be held accountable. The Cabinet Secretary is being held accountable. Now, it does not mean that she is responsible for every single little decision that is made in every part of the health service. And certainly it does not mean that she should resign if one or two of these decisions were wrong. Now, another issue that comes up through the amendments, both in Labour and the Lib Dems, are wording like financial pressures and the Lib Dems were, were suggesting budgets and policies have not been sufficiently adjusted. Now, it's again unclear to me what exactly that is meaning. If the key message is that more money should be put into health, that in itself raises further questions. Health has been one of the best protected sectors under the SNP, with spending now at 13.1 billion. 43% of the Scottish budget, I'm sorry, I've taken two already, I can't take another one, which is up from 38% in 2008 9 and in fact, when I was previously in the Finance Committee, some of the business organisations were saying we were spending too much on health. So if opposition MSPs are arguing for more money for the NHS, where is it to come from? Should we raise taxes? I don't think the Tories support that. And Labour have said they would raise a huge amount of money but couldn't tell us where it was coming from and nobody had checked it. Or should we be cutting expenditure in some other sector in order to give more to health? What would that be? Cuts to colleges or councils or what? The reality is that all of us, all organisations, all parts of the public sector have to live within our means. And we do have to make difficult choices. We have to prioritise the most important expenditure over what is good and what is desirable but is not a priority. And I think opposition politicians would have more credibility and be more respected both in here and outside 
if they came forward with realistic alternatives. Presiding officer, in conclusion, I personally think that Shona Robinson does an excellent job in what is clearly one of the most difficult and challenging of portfolios. I would not want her job. I congratulate her on sticking to the task, despite some of the unjustified criticism. Thank you. The last of the open debate contributions is from Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I refer the Chamber to my register of interest and I have a close uh, family member who is a healthcare professional in the Scottish NHS session. And I would actually agree with John Mason to, uh, and I'll start by recognising that the health brief is one of the most challenging briefs uh, within government. I think it's a brief where constructive dialogue and effective change uh, it can be problematic, not least of all for the adversarial environment that politics engenders. However, what cannot be ignored is the situation that has evolved over the last decade. We are debating the financial crisis that is now enveloping the NHS, a crisis that follows the GP crisis, the poor mental health crisis, the social care crisis, the, the recruitment and retention crisis, and the continuing rise in drink and drug deaths in Scotland, the obesity crisis, and so on and so on. And that lack of cohesive, joined up planning is becoming all too evident. I want to use an example. In Ayrshire and Ireland Health Board, they're looking at closing the Air Hospital Cancer Unit and amalgamating it with the one across house. However, the merits are otherwise of such a, mu a move fail to take into account the lack of adequate infrastructure and public transport from outlying areas. If you happen to live in Ballantrae in South Ayrshire, it will take you over three hours and two bus changes to get to Cross House for your cancer treatment. And then you have to take the reverse journey. And if you're taking the car, I wonder where exactly all these extra patients are going to park because the car park is absolutely rammed. Patient care is clearly not the top priority here. It is most certainly a financial decision. And at over £23 million in debt, how can Ayrshire and Arne be expected to deliver the four satellite treatment centres within the cancer treatment plan? Inevitably, patients are the ones suffering the consequences of that poor financial planning. And for me, the reality is that barometer we should be judging the management of the NHS by is the health and well-being of our nation. And by just about any measurement you care to mention, the government are failing. Scotland is the unhealthiest nation in Europe and the unhealthiest small country in the world. And we hold the top rank in too many unhealthy tables, as I've already previously stated. But perhaps more importantly, the health of our healthcare professionals continues to decline. In fact, our healthcare professionals' health is below the national average, which is already very poor. As Cosla have stated in evidence to the Health and Sport Committee, healthcare professionals will sacrifice their own health to look after the health of others. It's not understating the case to say that if the SNP do not address this issue, to give our NHS staff an environment where they have access to a decent work-life balance and that we want to them to promote to others, every Scottish Government strategy is doomed to follow the litany of failures over which it has presided in the past, past decade. Much has, been, much has been made of the recruitment into the NHS, as I asked the question to John Mason, to alleviate this, uh, this chronic staff shortage created by consistent poor workforce planning by this Government. However, looking after our healthcare professionals speaks to the retention of staff and that invaluable experience lost if they leave. It speaks to reducing the high levels of absenteeism in the healthcare profession due to stress and the unhealthy working environment the Scottish Government make our healthcare professionals work in. When I raise the issue of the preventable health agenda, um, uh, okay, I'll give away. To Fulton McGregor. Has the member had given any thought or assessment to how both Brexit and this party's own uh, budget? of reducing funds to the public sector would affect the workforce in the NHS. Brian Whittle. Can I, can I, can I thank the member for that intervention? Because it allows me to, to point out to the member that in this chamber, we talk, the, the SNP are very, very quick to say that there's a record amount of investment into the NHS, and yet we're in a financial crisis. We have a record number of, of, of staff, uh, staff uh, uh, vacancies with NHS, but it's Brexit. Ten years you've been in power. Ten years. Ten years. Through the chair, please, Mr Whittle. When I raise the issue of the preventable health agenda, the Cabinet Secretary and health team are always enthusiastic about their desire to shift direction towards this, and, and I, I do believe them in this. The trouble is we can't judge them on this because they cannot effectively address this agenda while continually firefighting the problems of their own making. It's not an environment for a long-term strategy planning required to support our NHS staff and put the NHS back on an even keel. The Cabinet Secretary must get a firm control of finance. It's not all about the money spent. It's also about what the money is spent on. As we've heard today from all the evidence, and the evidence I've heard in the sport, uh, sport and Health and Sport Committee on NHS governance, 
The spending patterns of NHS health boards and IJBs are not being properly tracked and accounted for. So where does the responsibility lie? There are those within this chamber who have been calling for the Cabinet Secretary's head, and I am not going to join them. For the most part, I believe it's a card that's become ineffectual if overplayed in the political arena, as Anna Sauer has proved. I think that the government's responsibility to appoint the front bench, and as such, the performance of the front bench, reflects the, M uh, the SNP. The fact that the Cabinet Secretary is still in place would indicate to me the Scottish Government are happy with the way the NHS is being managed. I think we should all be concerned with that. Patience may be a virtue, Deputy Presiding Officer, but as Miles Briggs' motion states, if sustained and immediate action is not taken, the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport should be held accountable. The Cabinet Secretary and the SP cannot keep pointing the finger in elsewhere. It's time to accept responsibility, take the critical action required, or step aside. Deputy Presiding Officer. We now move to the closing speeches. And I call on Dave Stewart for around six minutes, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, President Officer, and I want to thank Miles Briggs and his colleagues for bringing this important and pressing matter to debate uh, this afternoon. I think it's been a very well-informed debate with uh, passionate and very interesting uh, contributions from across the Chamber. And on the consensus side, could I just say that on this side of the Chamber we endorse Liz Smith's contribution about the management of joint integrated boards. Just to put that on the record, I think she made a very excellent point and we fully support that. Yeah. Of course, this debate is not just about numbers on a spreadsheet. It's about the conditions faced by staff and patients in our hospitals and our communities. And as Anna Sauer, Neil Finlay and Jackie Bailey have said in the debate, NHS staff in Scotland have been underpaid, undervalued and under-resourced. And it's the patients that have been feeling the pain of that in missed A&E targets, planned operations being cancelled, bed days being lost to delayed discharge, social care budgets being slashed, and seven out of eight key targets being missed for two years, according to Audit Scotland. But, President Officer, as with every member in the Chamber today, I feel passionate about the NHS. It's not just another issue, it's not just another debate, and it's not just another headline. And again, as with many members in the Chamber today, I have family and personal connections. My brother-in-law is a mental health nurse, my neighbour is a midwife, and my close friends a senior staff nurse. But as with other many members in the Chamber today, I do remember the history, although I wasn't there at the time, President Officer, on the 5th of July, 1948. Sylvia, Sylvia Beckenham was admitted to hospital for a liver condition. That was a big event in her life, but an even bigger event in British history. The 13-year-old was the first ever patient to be treated by the National Health Service. So the NHS, our NHS, will be 70 years old in July. As we all know, the Labour Party created the NHS, and three score years and ten later, we're still defending it. Faced with an early shortage of nurses in 1948, a familiar story today, now, Bevan pushed up their wages to attract recruits, a solution I would certainly recommend uh, to the Cabinet Secretary today. And the 1960s saw the first British heart and liver transplant and the first kidney transplant took place in Edinburgh Royal Infirmary. The 1970s saw the first test tube baby and CT scans, which revolutionised the way doctors examined patients. I'm, of course, proud, as everyone in this room is, of what the NHS can achieve. But I am prouder still of its hard-working frontline staff, the junior doctors, the nurses, the midwives, consultants, GPs, allied health professionals, porters and receptionists. But despite their hard-working commitment, we face challenges which have been touched on in this debate by Alison Johnston, Alec Cole Hamilton, Liz Smith, Ash Denham, Edward Mountain, Annie Wells, Miles Briggs and Brian Whittle. Our ageing population, the pressures in social care, the need for robust workforce planning now and post-Brexit, and a growing mental health crisis. Now, the nature of these public health challenges may look modern, but under the surface, the root causes are the same old story. Poverty, social deprivation and inequality are significant contributors to poor health expectations, and it's the least well-off who are most at risk. And we need to reverse the inverse care law where patients most in need of health care have the least access to it. Now, back in 1948, the NHS represented the advance of egalitarianism in our nation. There was great hope for the new future it heralded. And a Guardian news article from the time noted, and I quote, it's designed to offset as far as they can the inequalities that arise from the chances of life to ensure that a bad start or a stroke of bad luck, illness or accident or loss of work 
does not carry the heavy penalty, often crippling, it has carried in the past. Inequality in health was a serious issue then, and it sadly remains a serious issue now. Life expectancy in the UK has stalled, and in the past 50 years, the chasm between the health outcomes of the rich and the poor have widened. Is it not an outrage that in the 21st century, that individuals' health expectations are intrinsically tied to their postcode? Now, the theme of this debate has been about NHS financial accountability and the need for change. But don't just take my word for it. As Professor Sir Harry Burns said to the Health and Sport Committee this week, we need complex system change in the NHS. Dr Peter Benny from BNA Chair said the NHS workforce was stretched to breaking point. RCN Scotland in a survey showed that 9 out of 10 nurses say workload has got a lot, lot worse. And NHS Lothian, in the brief to our Health Committee and Sport Committee, and I quote, said, over the last three years, NHS Lothian has not been able to present a balanced financial plan at the start of each financial year and has increasingly relied on non-recurrent resources to achieve financial uh, balance. In closing, President Officer, as Nye Bevan famously said, the NHS will last as long as those are folk left with faith to fight for it. Let us at five o'clock put our faith in the frontline NHS staff across Scotland. Thank you. I call Shona Robson. Around seven minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, uh, Deputy President Officer. I, I vote for Dave Stewart as Labour health spokesperson. And I think that was a considered and well-informed contribution to the debate and a, a bit of a standout from his benches, I have to say. I want to try and come back on as many uh, contributions as I can. Apologies if I don't manage to come back on them all. Uh, I want to, first of all, uh, come back on remarks made by Anna Sauer and Jackie Bailey about the uh, clinical review of cancer waiting times uh, standards. Uh, they are simply wrong. First of all, we will not scrap cancer targets. The report they refer to is from an expert group of cancer clinicians who are looking at specific cancer pathways to ensure that they're in line with best clinical evidence and practice. The forward from the chair said uh, in the front of the report, the retention of the cancer waiting time standards was agreed from the outset. What this is looking at potentially is shortening some of those pathways for certain cancer types. So we'll consider the recommendations from these cancer clinicians in due course, as you would expect us uh, to do. Can I also say, um, in terms of the comments about the, the budget for uh, the health service, um, I want to just be very, very clear here um, in response to those who have uh, commented on it, that the uh, uplift uh, to our health budget amounts to 3.4% in cash terms and 1.9% uh, in real terms, taking the budget £360 million higher than real terms only increases since 2016-17. And in terms of our frontline NHS boards, that is a 2.2% increase in real terms, not a reduction, an increase in real terms. And I think it's important to put that on the record briefly. Yes. Miles Briggs. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for taking this intervention. As I said earlier, if Scottish health spending had kept pace with English health spending and increases, there would be an extra billion pounds spent on health in Scotland today. Does she not accept that point? Shona Robson. What I accept is that all resource consequentials have been passed on to health in full and some more of Scottish Government funding. What I also accept is that health spending in Scotland is 7.5% higher per head than in England. These are things surely that it should be uh, welcome. That, that equates, that equates, wait, that equates to over £880 million more spending on health services in Scotland compared to England. £880 million more. So hopefully that puts to bed some of the arguments uh, from the Tories. Can I uh, turn to Alison Johnson's uh, remarks? And uh, I hope she uh, will agree that what I have done is acted on some of the concerns that she raised around transparency uh, of finances and I'm, I hope that she will uh, welcome that and also the point she made about longer term funding. It has been very challenging because when we get a a one-year budget and the budgets of course are set by the UK government we then know what our budget is it's quite difficult to project that over a longer period of time but I accept that we need to try to do that and that's why the framework 
that we'll be publishing in the next few weeks in an attempt to look at that five-year horizon of funding. And I hope, again, Alison Johnson uh, will uh, welcome that. Uh, I want to also uh, turn to a point Alex Cole Hamilton made. Alex Cole Hamilton um, uh, uh, quoted um, from a, a Daily Mail article, uh, actually, saying that, uh, that Scots patients can't get painkillers prescribed on the NHS in Tayside. Can I say categorically, NHS Tayside has said that there are no plans to stop prescribing these medicines in primary care where they are felt to be clinically appropriate. So I hope that gives Alex Cole Hamilton the reassurance that he uh, requires, and anybody else for that matter. I also want to say this about John Connell's uh, resignation, uh, with the previous chair of NHS Tayside. Now I want to be very clear, uh, to put on record, first of all, that John Connell, uh, there is no question about his uh, probity or uh, as, as his contribution uh, to uh, public services. But what we had was a culmination of events, not a single event about the endowment fund, which absolutely predated his time in office, as it did mine, but a culmination of events that came to the conclusion that new leadership was required in NHS Tayside. And that is why I took the action that I did. And I have to say that the new chair and the new chief executive in NHS Tayside are making uh, rapid uh, progress on a number of uh, those issues. Very briefly. Jenny Mara. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for giving way. She knows we're, we're in this chamber because uh, initially of problems in our local health boards. News was released last night that there have been 72 drugs deaths in the city of Dundee since this time last year, a shocking doubling of the figure since the previous year. Can she take this opportunity to tell me what she's doing about this drugs crisis in Scotland and how she's going to fund services? Shona Robson. Uh, what Jenny Mara will be aware of is the commission set up in Dundee to tackle this. And you know that the complex reasons of the cohort of people who are involved here, very complex reasons. I met with the people undertaking the commission. I hope she's done likewise, because I think it's important to understand what the programme of work is that they'll be carrying out and if she hasn't I would suggest she does because I think it's important to know the work of the Commission uh, in uh, Dundee. Uh, can I welcome Liz Smith's tone in this debate? I think that was a, another uh, contribution that was very important and I agree with her. I think it is time to review the IGBs and I have said I will do that. I also agree with her about the governance issues of endowment funds. I think what this has taught us is a number of issues. One on audit that we need to have far better auditing of the processes so that those issues are pulled out for people to see. Because with the best will in the world, it is difficult for either me as a minister or government <coughs> officials to plough through every report of every public body. We require our auditing processes to highlight those issues and to red flag them. And that, I think, has to be a lesson learned for many organisations involved here. But I can give her this commitment that on the endowment funds governance issue, we will absolutely take action in partnership with Oscar to make those improvements that she uh, called for. Um, do I want Yes, you can have another right, minute and okay, a half, thank Minister. You. Um, Edward Mountain raised a number of issues, and I, I have had this exchange with Edward Mountain on a number of occasions, but it is worth me just reminding the Chamber that in the case of Caithness Maternity Unit, the decision there was taken due to patient safety concerns after the death of a baby. These issues are never easy. And I, as a minister, have to listen to the clinical advice that I am given uh, from the chief medical officer and others. And it would have been uh, impossible for me not to have taken uh, that advice. And on the issue of the governance review, as I hope I said in the intervention, the governance review in NHS Highland, I think, will help us uh, to make the, the changes that are required elsewhere in strengthening the governance of our uh, NHS. Um, Stuart McMillan, I recognise many of the, the successes he talked about, the difficulties faced by the, the service across um, the, the winter period and the heroic efforts of staff uh, to meet those. Can I say to Neil Finlay about the, the GP issues that he raises in his community? I know about that. That is why we have a new GP contract. That is why I published the primary care workforce plan on Monday with nearly £7 million of additional investment in our district nursing workforce, something that I would hope uh, people would uh, welcome. The ministers in their last few seconds. And to say, Claire Hawkey also raised an important point here. Yes, some of our boards have um, brokerage arrangements that are required. And of course, we put patient care first and foremost, and that's why these brokerage arrangements are important. But she was right to highlight the eye-watering £1.5 billion deficit of acute 
trust south of the border, which the Treasury year after year bails out. Now, you know, I accept that brokerage arrangements are sometimes required, but I think it is a bit rich not to recognise that financial position south of the border while coming and criticising the position uh, here. And I would just say to Annie Wells on that point, she said very clearly, and I'm sure the record will confirm this, that the NHS is underfunded. If she believes that, there is an onus then on her party to come to this chamber and say, how much is it underfunded by? And how much are you going to pr propose to put into the NHS? And where is it coming from? It is not good enough to say it's underfunded, but not to come here with those answers. And I hope we might hear that in the closing speech. <laughs> Presiding officer, come I hope close. I've been able to say here today and set out the actions that I will take as health secretary. I am not complacent in any way, and I'm sure that the tone of my uh, opening statement gave that. I recognise the problems. That's why we're taking all of the action that we are, and I hope the Chamber will recognise that. I call Murdo Fraser to wind up the debate. If you take us to just before decision time, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The Scottish Conservatives called this a debate to allow members across the Chamber to raise their concerns about the NHS in Scotland. And there are a broad range of concerns, as we've heard from members from across the country this afternoon, whether it's Edward Mountain in the Highlands, Annie Wells in Glasgow, or Brian Whittle in Ayrshire. Now, none of that is to take away from the fact that there's much good work going on in the NHS right across the country. And indeed, I would join with the Health Secretary in paying tribute to all those who work in the NHS for the care they deliver. And it's important, I think, that all members recognise that. But what we were doing in this debate today is putting the Health Secretary and indeed the government on notice that we do need real action to improve the situation across the country. We need to, to strengthen the oversight Parliament has of our NHS finances, and that starts with full publication of the current financial position of every NHS board, monthly updates of this Parliament's Health and Support and Public Audit Committee, and more information about integrated joint boards and their progress, and we need full transparency around budget scrutiny and local decision making. And I'm pleased that with the response we've had from the Health Secretary, that she's accepting our motion today, and she's given guarantees to make that information available. And I think that approach we've taken to this debate, I hope, has been constructive. And what the Conservatives aren't doing in this debate, as others are doing, is calling for the Health Secretary's resignation. And that's not because we are great supporters of the Health Secretary. It's simply because we believe that calls like that are a distraction from the more important business of trying to sort out the problems in the NHS for the benefit of all the people that we represent. <laughs> Simply appointing a new captain to the ship won't make any difference unless the ship changes direction. And it's that change of direction that we think is more important than the personalities involved. Now, I listen with great interest to the contributions from any of the SNP members in the debate. And they seem to be, uh, some of them, in denial about some of the issues that people are facing right across the country. Uh, Ash Denham and Claire Hockey wanted to talk about uh, health finances, but didn't want to take interventions from Conservative members who wanted to answer their questions. Although, to be fair, Stuart McMillan did allow Miles Briggs to come in. But let me deal with the question of finances because it's come up in the debate, and it's very important. We are spending, in the last year, £170 million on agency staff in the NHS, which, with better workforce planning, we could substantially reduce that number. We've spent 115 million in the last year on the cost of delayed discharge. Delayed discharge with the health secretary promised she could eliminate. And as Annie Wells said earlier, if we could better use the resources we are currently allocating to the NHS, that would make a huge difference in terms of tackling the problems we face. And also remind, um, yeah, I'll give away on that point. Stuart McMillan. I thank Murdo Fraser for taking intervention. So, uh, if Murdo Fraser is backing up his colleague Annie Wells, does that then mean that uh, he also uh, doesn't want additional resources into the NHS? Murdo Fraser. Well, I think I've just made the point, Mr. McMillan, as Annie Wells fairly said, you need to make best use of the resources that you currently have and make sure money is not being wasted. But let me make another point about funding. This is very important because I would remind SNP members, and particularly those who are drawing comparisons with the situation south of the border. We have nearly £1,500 more to spend for every man, woman and child in Scotland every year compared to the rest of the UK average, and much more than in England, 
thanks to the Barnett formula. And what do they want to do, presiding officer, to the Barnett formula? They want to tear it up. So we wouldn't have the benefit of that money at all. Now, I think the highlight uh, of the debate for many members was the contribution from James Dornan, yeah. who at least brings some comedic value to debates such as this. And Mr. Dornan spent his time denouncing the Tory motion before us this afternoon, a motion which his front bench has already accepted, a motion which presumably he is going to vote for in five minutes' time, but he thought it was worth denouncing. What a shame it is, presiding officer, that Mr Dornan has decided to withdraw his name from the race to be his party's deputy leader. What a, what a joy that would have been for the, for the notion. Oh, please. James Dornan. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Fraser. Can I, can I just say that I wasn't criticising the motion so much as criticising the, the, rank, the rank hypocrisy that was coming from members on your benches? Murder Fraser. Well, I think that the record will show, uh, presiding officer, uh, Mr Dornan's denunciation of the motion later. However, I want to return to the issue in NHS Tayside that a number of members have referred to, because there are a whole range of serious problems within that board area alone. NHS Tayside are missing five out of eight key waiting time targets and have failed to provide data for another, meaning they're currently only meeting one quarter of their vital targets. And we had the recent well-documented episode with the uh, misuse of endowment funds, which have had now to be repaid. And what was the Cabinet Secretary's response? It was to sack the chair of NHS Tayside, a hugely well-respected health professional, John Connell, who had been in office for just 18 months, despite the fact so the problems that had arisen in NHS Tayside predated his period in office. And yet he was thrown to the wolves by the Cabinet Secretary. He and other senior figures treated as human shields by this Health Secretary made to take the blame for failures not of their making. And what is most concerning about the situation in NHS Tayside is the financial position. Because we now have total brokerage supplied by the Scottish Government of over £33 million, with another £12 million expected all of which we assume the board will be asked to pay back at some point. And it's impossible to see this being done without a major impact on the patient experience. And it won't be saved by simply cancelling one-off prescriptions of paracetamol. I'll happily give way to the Health Secretary. Well, I've already clarified the issue of the paracetamol, but that's why we've said to NHS Tayside that they do not have to repay that for a period of at least three years in order to make sure that patient care is not impacted. Surely that is something the member would welcome. Murder Fraser. Well, people, the people I, I represent in areas like Perth and Kinross, what they want to see is the impact that that cost cutting is going to have in a long term or a medium term basis on the delivery of local services. Now we've seen plans mooted, the Health Secretary will be aware of, to remove all emergency surgery from Perth Royal Infirmary and relocate that to Nine Wells and to replace that with elective surgery moving in the other direction. But what guarantees do we now have that that programme will continue? Because they could not be given by the management of NHS Tayside when a number of colleagues, uh, including myself, met them just two weeks ago. And what does that mean for the future of accident and emergency at Perth Royal Infirmary if cost savings are having to be made? Because communities across Perth and Kinross have fought hard over recent years to retain services, and yet once again they potentially face risk due to financial failures on the watch of the Health Secretary. Presiding officer, my colleague uh, Liz Smith referred in this debate earlier to the question of integrated joint boards, and these were concerns reflected by many people. And I think there are huge issues here over lines of governance and accountability, and it is a model fast losing public confidence, and it is calling out for review and greater transparency around the decision making process. Presiding officer, we are not today calling for the resignation of the Health Secretary, although if press reports are to be believed, even some of our SNP colleagues are expecting her to be reshuffled. That in itself won't make anything better in the NHS. Instead, what we need is a new focus on sorting out the problems in Scotland's health service. And that needs to start with this parliament having a much greater sight of what exactly is happening with health service spending. We need to know the money is being properly spent and we need to stop being in denial about the scale of the, some of the problems that we face. That is what staff in the NHS need to give them the, they, the reassurance they need it is what patients want to see and it is what our constituents expect from us. I urge Parliament to support the motion in Miles Briggs's name. Thank you very much. And that concludes our debate on NHS financial accountability. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 
12003, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, setting out a business programme. I would ask any member who wishes to speak against the motion to say so now. I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move the motion. Formally moved. Thank you very much. No one has asked to speak, therefore the question is that motion 12003 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next item of business is consideration of three Bureau motions. Could I ask Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Bureau to move motions 12004-12005 uh, on committee meeting times and motion 12006 on designation of a lead committee. Move together. So we turn to decision time. The first question is an amendment 11984.4 in the name of Shona Robison, which seeks to amend motion 11984 in the name of Miles Briggs on NHS financial accountability be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that amendment 11984.1 in the name of Anas Sarwar, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Miles Briggs be agreed. Are we agreed? No. We're not agreed. We we'll move to a division. Members may count their votes, may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 11984.1 in the name of Anas Sarwar is yes, 60, no, 61. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that a motion 11984 in the name of Miles Briggs as amended on NHS financial accountability be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And I propose to ask a single question on three parliamentary bureau motions. Does anyone object? No, that's good. The question, therefore, is that motions 12004 to 12006 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Thank you very much. That concludes decision time, and we'll now move to members' business in the name of Mark Ruskell on civil contingency in nuclear weapons transport. And we'll just take a few moments for members and the ministers to change their seats. <laughs>